sitting beside me is one half of the greatest tag team in the history of professional wrestling. Road Warrior Animal, thanks for being here. What's up, man? How you doing, bro? Good, man. Do you, uh, launching off that, do you feel you're the greatest tag team in the history of the business? You know, uh, I suppose if you go by accolades and different things like that, probably, you know, I don't leave that up to me. I leave that up to the wrestling fan. But, you know, it's kind of funny, you know, in, in winning multiple tag team championships, like for the same league, I was counting them the other day. Some fan asked me to count them. I think Hawk and I won some like 16 different. Right. So to, to win that many different ones and go to different continents and different countries, it's a little bit more, we're a little bit more broad based, you know? Right. We were discussing this before you got here about how you rank, because like, it's, it's easy in sports. Yeah. And yeah. when in professional wrestling, it's a little subjective. But when you guys were dominating the scene, it was a lot harder to dominate the scene. A lot harder to dominate the scene. And, and you, you, what we did, you don't ever see anymore. We were main events as a tag team. Right. You don't ever see that. You probably never see that again in the wrestling business, right? But the, I think in, as far as that goes, and, and to be quite honest with you, it's about putting butts in seats. Right. And Hawk and I were able to put butts in seats. And uh, I think the biggest credit amongst the guys, when you know you've done something right, is when someone gets a halfway decent cheer, they call it a warrior pop. Right. They don't call it a road warrior pop for nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, because, I mean, we now that I step back and I look back now, you know, this many years later, and I, and I go and I watch it, and, like, I, I, like I was out at WrestleCon, right? And I did uh, Bruce Pritchard and uh, Conrad's uh, live podcast. And uh, yeah, you forget about the times and how much the fans really invest, how much they love your thing, right? And in doing that, when uh, I did a surprise entry and nobody knew I was there and it's all other WWE guys, and all of a sudden I got on the microphone and I went, L-O-D. They freaking erupted into about a five-minute L-O-D chant. And Bruce Pritchard said, ladies and gentlemen, that's a road warrior pop right there. And you forget how much you used to be able to erupt the roof off the building, like tear the roof off the house type right. deal. And in that sense, because I think Hawk and I being the guys that said, hey, we don't care if you're a good guy or we don't care if you're a bad guy. We're going to take on all comers, right? So in that sense, maybe you might have to say we're, we're, the, we're the best tag team of all time. Well, listen, I respect and I appreciate the guys that paved the road before me. The Briscoes, the Funks, all the guys, the Wild Samoans, Alfred Sika, all those guys, man. There was a lot of Greg Grania, Jim Brunzel, a lot of great tag teams for Hawk and I. We just happened to come in an era where the wrestling business was dead, and we helped. We were a part of that wave that helped get it to where it is today. You know, you had Hulk Hogan that was with WWF, and then Hawk and I were with the NWA with Flair, and Hulk Hogan was with Snook and those guys, and Piper. It was just a good mix at the time to have two different companies going strong. You know what I mean? Didn't you say once that when you saw Greg Gagne one time wrestle on TV, you knew you could be a wrestler? Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> listen, I used to bounce in this bar in Minnesota. Check this out. I bounced in this bar in Minnesota called Thumpers. Right. It was, way, it was outside of Minneapolis a little bit. And one time, uh, Jim Brunzel came in. It was actually Jim Brunzel. Now, I was respectful of Jim Brunzel, University of Minnesota, high jump champ, national champ and all that. He came in the bar, and he was a big fan of this one band called Fragile. I'll never forget it. Get a little bit too much drink, a little bit rowdy. I tap on their shoulder and say, hey, listen, this is not D-A-W-A, bro. And I was only about 19 years old. I said, right. you'll behave in this place. Otherwise, I will see you outside. <laughs> right. You know, and Jim and I laugh about it now, but, you know, at the time, it was pretty, you know. But, yeah, we did that, too. I remember Hawk used to tell Greg Gagne during promos, you know, Man, you look like a stir stick or, or, <laughs> or interviews like, hey, your mom gave you a bubble bath to your kids. She never took out the plunger for you to float down the drain, you know, <laughs> right. that kind of stuff, right. you know. But it was crazy like that, man. Going back to those days when you talk about when you see when you would see wrestlers and stuff like that, coming from your background, a, a legi I mean, I don't want to say legitimate athlete because that, that disparaged wrestlers, but coming yeah. from mainstream sports like football and, and, yeah. and everything that you did, did you, I don't want to say look down on wrestling, but did you, uh, professional wrestling, but... Being the athlete that you were and not so much the entertainer at that point, did you think that professional wrestling was beneath you in any way? You know, I, I never watched wrestling very much. I, the first wrestling match I watched was uh, Hulk Hogan versus Nick Bockwinkle for the AWA belt. Now, I saw Hulk Hogan came into my gym when I was about 18 years old, 
And I looked at it and I said, hey, this guy's a freaking monster. Where'd this guy come from? Because right. you know, we, were, we were the strongest guys in the state at that time. We were young powerlifters, myself and Smash the Demolition and Wayne the Train Bloom that was one of the Beverly Brothers. We're all lifting heavy. And then uh, I saw that, when I saw that match, I said, wow, this stuff is pretty cool. And then of course, Ed Sharkey was our bartender. We never even knew, knew that Ed Sharkey trained Jesse Ventura. Right. And then he says, oh, I'm thinking about doing another, another camp, you know? I'm sorry, man. That's my pizza, bro. Hello? Have him send the guy up yeah, here. You can bring it up through 505. When I, hey, when, anim, when animal wants to eat, animal eats. <laughs> bro, I, I know. I ordered a pizza and it's been like, took like an hour and a half to get here. Hey, you can eat it during the interview. It's fine with me. That's fine. Cool. Take a break. It's up to you. Well, well, we'll just keep going. We'll, okay. Did Jesse Ventura uh, say that you guys would never make it? You know, um, Ventura kind of had a little bit of an attitude, but I think that was mostly to protect the wrestling business. I mean, you got to understand, he was top dog at the AWA and then went to WWF, and he, he was announcing like crazy. It was him and a man on the mic. Right. Uh, the guys had told us, the, I'll tell you a funny story. When I, when I first got in, and I wasn't even tagging with Hawk yet, uh, I was in a battle royal for Jim Crocker Promotions, and uh, I was in a battle royal with Roddy Piper. Right. And like a dummy, I was supposed to be out number five, and I ended up being like number eight <laughs> or ten. Or I was with there way too long. I should have been in there. Right. What are you still doing in there, kid? Get out of here. Piper threw me out. So I'm sitting there, and I'll never forget the Holiday Inn in Richmond, Virginia. And I was really nice and cordial, like like young guys should be in the wrestling business. Hey, Mr. Piper, how you doing? Joe Lauren, I said, I know you are, kid. Sit down here. He goes, let me buy you a drink. Because I couldn't even afford a drink. I was just trying to get a glass of water. I literally lived off a bag of pretzel sticks and a half a gallon of milk for a week. Right. I was making no money. I was making $150 working seven days a week. That was my total pay. Right. I was getting so hosed at the time, right? Piper goes, let me buy you this. You want a hamburger? I'll buy you a hamburger. And he goes, so what do you expect out of the wrestling business? And I said, well, I said, it's amazing what you do and the control you have with the people. I hope to someday be able to be half as good as that. And Piper looked right at me and says, kid... I don't know if you got what it takes. Wow. I said, talk about a jab in the heart. I felt, <laughs> right. I felt like knocking them out right there. You right. know. I said, nobody ever talked to me like that. Not in the bar, anywhere. And I said, God dang, man. I totally popped my bubble. So really shortly after that, I was only there for three months. I gave my notice to Crockett. I said, Mr. Crockett, Jimmy Crockett. I said, I can't work for this, man. I said, I got, I got to leave. I got, I got to leave. I got to go home. I got child support. I have car payments. I can't, I'm making $150 a week. I can't even pay nothing. So I quit, actually went home, and that's when I ran into Rick Martell in my gym. Now, because I dropped from 280 to 225 in body weight because I was starving in the NWA. Right. I get home, now Rick Martell is the AWA champ. I'm in the gym doing incline, so now I've gained about 30 pounds back. And uh, hold on a minute. We got pizza, but there's yeah. pizza at the door. I, I better make sure I, Rob pays. Hey, Rob. Yes. Do me a favor. Give him a couple dollar tip and just sign my name. Rob, tip him good because you usually short the guy. No, I already put it on my card. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, so Rick Martel is sitting there, you know, majeure in French, you know, French Canadian. He goes, well, you know, I hear you're bad mouthing the business. And he goes, I just want to give you a fair warning. So, that yeah. was going around that you were like. Well, I, in, the, in the area there in the AWA because right. I knew Henning real well and everything else. And I was, yeah, I was pissed off. Yeah. I mean, I was pissed off. Were you that, vocal at a young age? Like, would you, like, go Yeah, man. And... I, I, listen, I'm a Philly guy. If I didn't like <laughs> right. something, I was going to let you know I didn't like it. I'm not right. going to wait 10 minutes. I'm going to let you know now. Right. I'd rather take care of the situation now. Don't let it fester, because if it's fester, it's really going to get ugly. Hmm. You know, so I want to take care of it. So Rick Martell actually said something, being really nice, and I said, listen here, champ. I said, see that belt you got out there in your, in your car, in your bag? I said, how about we go outside and I take it from you right now? <laughs> and I, I, I was dead serious. I said, I will take it, then I will hit you with it, and I will not even think twice about doing it. And I, I was so pissed at the time. He goes, no, 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 I'm just giving you a fair warning. I said, well, yeah, warning taken, good, thanks, man. And that was it. Wow. And then shortly after that, it's what Ole Anderson came back in the bar, saw a picture of Hawk, he, and asked that Sharky, where'd you get this picture of Joe? And he says, that's no, that's Mike. He goes, there's two of these guys? He goes, oh, I got a great idea, the Road Warriors. You know, right. so, and that's how the Road Warriors became the team. Interesting. P 
pizza? Ah, oh, pizza, man. Not like a Philly pizza. Pizza time. Rob didn't even, Rob didn't even pick up the tab. No, I didn't know. Uh, Bro, look yeah, at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a different kind of pizza. What is that, meatballs on there? No, man, that's Italian sausage. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Fit you got, for you guys animal. want a piece? I got, I got enough for everybody. I'm, I'm a vegetarian animal. Pieces. I'm just going to take one. I'm a vegetarian. Oh, are you really? Okay. <laughs> I'll never eat this. I'll have Joe edit this. Why? This is great. Oh, you want? I'll keep it on. No, let it roll. This is real. This is what Reflections is all about, ladies and gentlemen. It's real. Philly fun? pizza. Oh, Becca wants a slice. Is it good? Come on over, Bex. Yeah, I want to kind of get like a margarita, but. Thanks so much. I'll give you one if you want. Please. Uh, yeah. Boy, what, 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 what a host. Buy the pizza after I there's know, already right? a pizza no, no, sitting no. here. He said he wants a drink, a margarita drink. No, no, no. no. Margarita no, pizza. Wanna, you got water, oh. Rob? Okay, yeah. I'll get it here. A bottle. <laughs> no, no, I need an action. There was a story. Let me tell you a quick story I, I wanted to get your opinion on, and, and we can go back to what you were saying. I, I, I talked to, uh, I interviewed Greg Gagne. He, sure. told, he told a story about um, Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan was on his way to, on a plane to sign a contract with Vince. Hem and Vern didn't know that he was on his way in a plane to sign with Vince. Mm. Meanwhile, they had, they had done something where they contacted some Russian guy who was gonna, they were in, in contract negotiations where Hogan was gonna go over to Russia and wrestle some Russian uh, Olympic champion. Oh, he got killed. And he, they, Greg Gagne swears up and down that if they would have got to Hogan first before he got on that plane and presented him that idea, he would have never left to the, and stayed in the AWA and the, and the whole landscape of wrestling would have changed. I don't doubt it, man. Listen, I'll be the first one to tell you, Hulk Hogan changed our business all the way. I mean, one for Hulk Hogan, Hulk and I wouldn't be thought of as the Hulk Hogan the tag team. Well, Hulk credits him for getting him involved in the business, yeah, from man. what I heard. Yeah. What was he like when you first met, when he walked into that gym? Did anybody, did you approach him? I didn't day? even know who he was. You just saw the big guy in the... In he, it was he and, he and uh, Beefcake, who was Dizzy Ed Boulder at the time. Right. And they both came in, big guys. Beefcake was about 270, Hulk was about 320, and all tan, just came in from Tampa, you know, and big guys. And, and uh, all the thing I said, I was like, holy crap. My, you know, my first thing as a gym rat is, how much does he bench? Right. How much is he doing? And Hogan was just monstrous at the time. I said, you know what? I see how big he is. I said, I want to be bigger than that. And I did end up physically being, at one time, I was 320, bigger than Hogan was. I mean, yeah. I, had, I had like 24, I literally had 24-inch pythons, right. you know, at one time. And, and that was my goal, cause, you know, working out all the time. Because I used to go home, and guys like Warlord that were learning how to wrestle and going through a camp, I remember going over to Warlord's house and talking to him about it. Right. Before I even got into wrestling. Because Warlord used to work out at our gym, too. And then he became a monster. You know? he, they uh, ended up having a gimmick very similar to you. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Warlord, listen, people always ask me, how do you feel about this team copying you? How about you feel about this team copying you? Love Philly pizza. To be quite honest with you, there is no, there is no animosity. Now, guys like Powers of Pain, Barbarian Warlord, great friends of mine. You know, I've known them for thirty years. And same with Demolition. I've no, I, knew, I wrestled Bill when he was a mass superstar. Right. For gosh sake, you know, he and Stan Hansen, which was a fight. <coughs> Everybody always says, "Oh, the Road Warriors are stiff." And that, are, are you kidding me? Get Hanson and Superstar, Matt Superstar, man. They'll beat the crap out of you if you let them. Right. Same with the Funks. If you let someone take an inch, they're going to take a mile, you know, in this sure. business. But the only problem I have, like, with t t today's guys are, like, okay, the Ascension, for instance. And I hope they don't do this with the Authors of Pain. The Ascension, what killed them right off the bat is you come in there and start cutting a promo about the Road Warriors. Yeah. You might as well just hang them because they're going to be dead. Because the true wrestling fan like yourself is going to say, no freaking way are you ever going to get to that level. It's too hard to get to that level anymore as a tag team. Right. They won't let you. You know it's a, it's a singles business up there. They're never going to let you get that hot up there 
in WWE. Do you think that's in, that in some way the office is sabotage? I mean, if, if that were me, and they, I mean, nothing, it's not like you can just go out in the glory days and just cut a promo. Everything is, is given to you. So that yeah. must have been given to them by the office. Oh, yeah, you know the writers are telling them to say that. Right, yeah, so isn't is that stupid. career suicide but, and them, they're sabotaging their own people? Exactly, but here what you got is a, is a soap opera writer telling you what to say, a guy that's never stepped foot in the ring, P- pretty much never stepped foot in the arena. Right. Now he's trying to tell an athlete what to say. And you're, you're right. You mentioned it before about athletes. You know, there are great athletes in, oh, thank you, man, in pro wrestling. I mean, a lot of great ex-basketball players, football players, amateur wrestlers, a lot of gymnasts that get in our business now. And uh, so the athletic quality is all there. It's the manner in which they let them use their athletic quality. You know, right. when you start, when you're like the Ascension and you start mentioning our name in a promo, the people just crap on it. And I hope they don't do this with the Authors of Pain. I heard they wanted to start doing that already with Ellering. If they do that, it will kill them too. It looks like it. I mean, they're walking out with them. They're doing. Well, they just got rid of Ellering. Yeah, I saw that the first time on uh, on, on the programming. Um, it's. Just just the way that, I mean, when we talk, go back a little bit and touch on greatest tag teams, and, and, and when you say, like, a tag team now, there's no way, in my opinion, and we'll get your opinion, Oops. that that a team, that's okay. But uh-huh. any, any damage to the room. Uh, Even Road Warriors spill pizza. <laughs> there's no way that, uh, that a team now could ever achieve the success that a team that you had because you can't, you're a product of television. You're a product of a writer. Yeah. You can't go out and create an aura in Japan. You yeah. can't go out and create an aura. They won't let you. Right, you can't do anything. You. You're trapped. Well, they're, they're owned by you. You're, right. owned, you're owned by them, as a matter of you're fact. You're a likeness. So they own your likeness, everything else. So we did our contract. We let our likeness was owned for the term of the contract. Right. And then it became ours again. And a little different with us. We were already an established talent. Right. Before even going up there, so... Even if they would have wanted to try, there's not a judge in the land that's going to say, well, you, you guys can't use road orders anymore because you had a contract with them. No. What was your first meeting like with Vince? Uh, we actually went to Vince's house. It was Hawk and I and Ellering went to Vince's house. And uh, we were just negotiating with Jim Crockett with a guaranteed contract. So nobody had guaranteed contracts at the time. So we were going to be the first ones besides Flair that had a guaranteed contract with the NWA. So we go to Vince's mansion out there in, uh, I think it's in Stamford, Connecticut. Yeah. And uh, we go to the office. We went to the house first. Sat there, and it was kind of funny in a way because Vince got up to leave the meeting at one time, but he left all Piper's and Hogan's merchandising numbers. They're sitting right on there in the printout. <laughs> like, we're not going to look, right? He goes, yeah, you got merchandise stuff here. Here's numbers right here. Of course we looked. Baiting the hook. So we saw that, but we went to Vince and listen, Vince, here's our guarantee contract. Can you match that? We're going to do a guarantee. And he says, well, at the time, we don't do guarantee contracts. We give you opportunity. I said, well, I can't pay bills on opportunity. Right. So if you have a guaranteed contract, we would do it. Otherwise, we're probably just going to stay with the AWA. And that's what we did. But going in Vince's house, I mean, it was actually kind of an interesting thing. I mean, above his fireplace mantle was this, like, big, like, five-foot by eight-foot painting of Vince in one of those green, total green suits and everything like that. And, of course, I, Hawk and I were jabbing with him a little bit about the painting on the wall. And, you know, we actually had a great meeting with him. You know, he had, a chi- like, an oriental chef that made us some really, like, authentic, like, chicken fried rice and all that kind of stuff. It was Actually, really good. We had a nice meeting, and then we went to the office, looked around the office, but then we decided to stay with the NWA. Right. Was he down to earth, or did did he seem uh, did he seem put off that you guys turned down his deal? I, I think so. He played it off like he didn't care, but I think he really did care. Right. Because you probably at the time were probably we, the only person. We were the only one. That, we were only one that didn't jump. Right. To go there at one time, you know. Right. Do you think he would come, do you think he would uh, hold that against you in the future? Mm, I don't think you know I like to think that he wouldn't hold it against us. But I tell you what, one way I know he did. 
He knew what we were making and what we needed to make and what we deserved to make by the time we came in there as a team. And he pulled the old, oh, well, you're a team, so I can't pay you what like a single guy would be paying. I got to split it up because there's two of you. And I was thinking to myself, that's crap because we're selling <laughs> a lot of merchandise. Right. You're selling hundreds of millions of dollars of merchandise with us. Come on, you know. So he says, okay. I said, well, as long as you make what we were making when we were singles, and then the first year, we made a hundred grand less hmm. than what he shook hands on. We said, hey, man, you said we were going to make it. I'll make it up to you the second year. It was a hundred grand less again. So now we're short about 200 grand each working for Vince. Right. So that's where Hawks start getting really pissy and saying, you know, screw Vince. If I want to go party and I'm going to go drink, I'm going to go party and drink. This gr- I'm a grown ass man. He goes, Vince is screwing us on pay. I'm going to go do this. Were people in the office trying to turn the screws on Hawk and keep him on the straight and narrow? Well, I was trying to because he's my partner. Man. Right. I was trying to keep him on the straight and narrow, you know, but, but yeah, they, they tested him a lot and, they came and told him he pissed dirty a couple of times, which we both, we both knew he wasn't dirty. Right. And Hawk said, test me again. I'll tell you right now I'm not dirty. I can promise you I'm not dirty. Hmm. And, you know, but then again, but Hawk was bucking the system, you know. He, and I try to tell Hawk, listen, man, you work for 3M or Honeywell or any of those companies, you got rules and regulations you got to buy by. But Hawk just didn't want to do it. He goes, man, this guy's screwing us on pay animal. I'm sick of this crap. And then finally when the straw broke the camel's back was in SummerSlam 92 and you know, at Wembley Stadium, the Hawk flipped out. Right. Going, but before we get uh, any, any further in that, is talking money. The merchandise machine back then was cranking. Oh, underwear, bed sheets, pillowcases. Yeah. Uh, you eat- Jackets, backpacks, lunch boxes, Styro- everything. Styrofoam shoulder pads. Styrofoam shoulder pads, which I brought to the company. The guy from Janko Corporation in Connecticut, I was on a plane flight, he goes, hey, I say, what, you ever thought about making foam rubber shoulder pads for kids? What a great idea. And so they came with the press, and they even did signatures in the pad. Right. And uh, they sold, they're still selling them in the UK somewhere. <laughs> so, but they're selling like for 250 bucks now, was back then they were only like $18. Right. right? And uh, yeah, they, and they sold a ton of them, man. They, they made so much money marketing. Bro, you know, we lost out on a lot of money. That's what I was going to ask. Like, so you're, they're a machine when it comes to marketing oh. and, and cranking out merchandise. Where where do you sit on that? Do they co- approach you? Like, it, or, or do you just get a set percentage and that's it? It was a set percentage. I think it's a half of 1%. Wow. Yeah, which is hosing, yeah. Here's a kicker. My last time I'm in the company, I talked to my brother about this. And I said, hey, what if I come in, I give you a break in the money, you give me a higher percentage of marketing. I know what I sell marketing. This is with Heidenreich now. Right. I said, I'll come in there and do it. No, no, we can't do it. Everybody in the company gets straight across the board the same thing. I said, really? You think Bret Hart and Hulk Hogan and Shawn Michaels and Steve Austin are getting the same? I'm telling you, everybody's getting the same. Well, then I found out afterwards... They weren't getting the same thing. How do you feel about your brother, your your own brother? Well, I wasn't too happy with him. It's actually caused a riff. I've never really talked to my brother about it, but it's caused a riff between my brother and I for him saying that. Right. Because it's not really, I mean, it's not really cool to do and stuff like that. You know what I mean? I, and, and that's one of the things, you know, he would, I don't want to really put all the blame on him, but he would come back and then, you know, I would say, listen. Why don't you make me an agent? Why don't you let me be the trainer or something? I would love to have done something like that and train the new guys in the wrestling business, you know? And then he said, well, I talked to Vince, and Vince said, nepotism, John, nepotism. Well, nepotism, you got your son, daughter, and wife working for the company. Right. What do you mean, nepotism? Uh, going off that, and I was going to get into this later, but since we're into it now, we'll, we'll go right for it. So, okay, so you, the, as, as far as a trainer and anything else like that, we'll take that, we'll take that <coughs> in a minute. But I mean, as far as like the little things, like you've never even been asked to an access. I've never been to a, a fan access, but it's kind of funny though. When any ever anybody was doing a meet and greet behind the stage and we were in that town, the guys would come to us. Whether it was David Hebner running it or Mark Carano, they would come to the, the LOD and the LOD, would, yeah, sure, man. Yeah, we're done painting up, we'll come. Right. Let me paint up first. I went to the, for the pictures, you know. We'll come and do the meet and greet. And we did it every house show. Never once, even before the Hall of Fame, even after I got put in the Hall of Fame in 2011, 
Have I ever been asked to do a fan access? None of that stuff for WrestleMania. Ever. I mean, that's, that's mind-boggling. I've been a main event in WrestleMania. Come on, with a tag team. Chicago Street Fight in Chicago, right? Right. Never been asked one time. The Hall of Fame, how did that come about? Because it seems like you're not in good standing with whoever, I mean, with Vince or whoever is making those decisions. You know, I, I never had any heat with anybody there. I mean, I know Hawk pissed off a lot of people, because especially the way he quit. Right. You know, here we go. We were supposed to be one of the main events for the title in SummerSlam, and then, to be quite honest with you, he was all placidilled up on pills, and, and they moved us from, like, second to last match to second match, right. or first match, and... But, you know, when you watch it back, though, you see who the people came to see. I mean, it was freaking deafening. You, you still got start, the loudest. Start on the show, man. And it's the loudest pop of the whole night. And uh, we felt bad. But, I mean, Vince was pissed. I, mean, I could see him in there talking to Hawk during the re... You know, we went over the entrance because the entrance was about 150 yards long mm -hmm. with the motorcycles. And wanted to make sure Hawk was okay to drive the bike. And, you know, Vince was so pissed because Hawk was messed up. And I think he got mad at me because... Nothing I could do about it. I was straight. I was always straight. Right. I was, I was always the business guy. Every finish, everything we did with wrestling, I was the guy they came to, and I would tell Mike what we're doing. I would tell Hawk what we're doing. And, but that's the way we always worked it. You know? Did that, did that come, become frustrating for you, like, like all the uh, irresponsibilities of Hawk falling on your shoulders? Listen, man, yeah, you know, I love my partner. We of were course. like brothers, of course. Of course. But like, like every relationship or whatever, there's always something that I'm sure there's some stuff that I did that pisses him off. And when he did that, and he would always come apologize and everything else, but he, I don't think he knew to the gravity, except right before he died, how much that screwed us out of millions of dollars. Right. Because, you know, you, sometimes you got to look at the big picture and say, listen, man, to do this drug or do this this day, is that really worth it to take million dollars out of your pocket down the line? And that's what ended up happening, right. you know? Because I, I think I got kind of rolled into the big bundle of the crap that sure. he was doing sometimes. And because you're guilty by association, man. We were the road warriors. We weren't just, hey, let's put road warrior animal together with road warrior hawk and call them road warriors. We were the road warriors. We were a team. Our money was with together because we fed off each other on promos. We just had an instinct with each other that just flowed in the ring that you, really you really can't teach sometimes, you know, and... We had we had we had pretty cool. I think uh, Flair said it the right way one time. He goes, "You guys had natural charisma together. We could just feed off each other." And I could look at Hawk in the ring, and I could know where he was lost, what he was missing. If he was lost in a match somewhere, if he banged his head, I could tell what was wrong with him, and he could tell with me. There's a match against uh, Jumbo Tsuruda, uh, Shunji Takano, and um, and Yatsu in Japan. And we had a six man, and I broke my ankle about halfway through the match. Thank God I had the motocross boots on that tie tight because I, I I turned completely white and Hawk said, Adam, what's wrong? I said, bro, I think I just broke my ankle. Hmm. He goes, I'll get out of the ring. Tenru and I will take over. They worked the next six, seven minutes until, you know, your own your own morphine kicks in in your body where you, you all of a sudden you can ignore the pain, right? Right. And that's what happened. So then I came in, did my couple things, and then we did the finish and went home. But man, I tell you, we 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 had telepathy. We we could look at each other and just know what's going on. We weren't just two guys you just got in a company and threw them together. You right. Know? We were different. Why do you don't? Why do you think you didn't fall prey to the the demons of the business? Well, I never would anyway. See, I was raised in a jock family. My dad was a was an all American at LaSalle College for baseball. You know, Philly guy he went to North Catholic High School, and uh, you know, I grew up in that athletic mindset attitude of my family. That's why none of my kids ever did drugs, because they grew up in that household. Right. And to be quite honest with you, Uncle Hawk was over my house a couple of times on muscle relaxers and fell over my 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 uh, coffee table. Right. You know, you know right. don't do that. <laughs> uh -oh. Uncle Hawk's dizzy. He had too much to drink. You know, <laughs> they want to tell him the truth. And when they got older, they knew. And right. they, you know, especially when they experienced stuff. But you don't want to, you know, pop their bubble because that was Uncle Hawk, right? But yeah, man, it's uh, I never fell prey to it. I just didn't. I don't like ever not being in control. Even though I'm out with the boys drinking or any, I don't like letting myself get out of control where I'm not controlling my my senses and know what's going on around me. Man, right. I, I've been in too many situations that are that are pretty hairy, and I and I, you know I want to make sure if something ever goes down, I know where I'm at. Right. 
and I could help my friends too. You know, I, I just wanted to make sure I was in that, that mindset. Sure. Did you ever feel alienated a little bit from the boys because of, uh, you know, maybe you didn't party as much as everyone else? You know, Hawk said that to me one time. Animal, you think you're not one of the boys. The boys don't like you because you don't come in a room and get high. <laughs> and I looked right at Hawk. I said, bro, if I got to go get stoned to be one of the boys, I said, then F them. Wow. I said, I said, and you could tell them that. I don't care. I'm not going to go do that if I have to. And, you know, after a while, like when the guys, listen, everybody's got a different personality, right? And as soon as they get to know how you are, then they'll respect that. Right. Because I respected the guys. I never once, even my partner, I never once down looked on anybody that did what they did. I said, listen, man, you got to pay the piper someday, not me. You know, and if you do that and you make stupid mistakes... That's what ends up happening. Was there any? Is there anybody that looked up to you because of that? Do you th- uh, along the well? Over there's the some years? guys. You know, when we got in the NWA, and then when Sting came in, and the Steiner brothers came in, that's why I traveled with the Steiner brothers and Sting and Luger because we had the same kind of things. We like to do hobbies. We wanted to eat, go to the gym, work out. If we wanted to go to tanning, but whatever. When Hawk would travel with the guys who like to smoke a little bit of dope, right? You know. He'd be great in the business today. Now that it's legal in most of the states in the country, right? right? So he'd be right up his alley. But back then, you know, I didn't want to travel with the guys like that. Sure. First of all, you know, my dad died. My dad. My grandfather died of lung cancer and bone cancer. Smoked like a sieve, man. I remember that when I was a kid. I grew up in a real ethnic Lithuanian Polish neighborhood here in Philly. And and, and everybody smoked because that was just a thing you did from Europe, you yeah. know, and and my grandfather smoked, and I just I couldn't stand the smell of smoke. And I watched him wither away and die. And I said, I am never going to do that. And I never did. Right. Never so smoked. That's probably the answer to the question. You probably had that uh, addiction, the, the, the um, results of it in your mindset. Oh, bro, it was, it was an instant, you know, non-addictive thing right away. I right. mean, I saw what that happened. I saw him wither away to nothing. I said, I am not putting my body through that. Right. There's enough crap going on in, in food and everything else. And here I am sitting eating a pizza. I hardly ever eat pizza, but I come to Philly. I want to have a Philly pizza. <laughs> sure, Figure why that not? Out. Uh, let's talk about Sting a little bit. Um, what, was, uh, what were your first impressions of Sting when he, when he came into the business? Were you, uh, when, <coughs> when, all right, let me ask. Before Sting, when somebody would come in with, uh, with a face paint, would you be apprehensive to that guy? Or th- is, that a, is that a rite of passage? Is that, like, is that warrior stripes? Like, is that something to be earned? Well, I'll give you a couple stories here. A really cool one. First, because Linger, Luger and Sting were together a lot. We go to wrestle down in Florida. This is, this is pre-Sting. Luger just broke in by Hiro Matsuda in Florida. Hawk and I go down there and work a shot. And Hiro Masuda ordered Kevin Sullivan, he goes, you bring in the Road Warriors or we're going to lose the Florida Territory. So Kevin brought us in. We did a deal with um, Mark Lewin and Kevin Sullivan, you know, the Prince of Darkness thing and everything else. With, uh, else? Yeah, with, but with uh, uh, King Curtis came over. He's still alive. And, uh, and then it was Hawk and I and Blackjack Mulligan for the six man, right? Yep. And we came in there and we just tore it up. Every house for the next... Six, seven, eight shows in Florida was sold out in Tampa. All over Florida, we started going, right? But Luger was a young punk that was coming down to Black Sabbath Iron Man. Ooh. And I think the boys ribbed him because we came in and we heard, we said, what's your losing? And Luger was Black Sabbath Iron Man. And Hawk goes, Hawk didn't even miss a beat. He says, hey, kid. You're gonna, we got an issue here. And Luger's, Luger tells the story great. He goes, Oh crap! He goes, we. He goes, no, we ain't got an issue. What's the problem? You know? He goes, we go out to the same music. And Luger goes, not anymore. We don't. And Luger changed Black Sabbath Iron Man. So that was the first impression with Luger. First one with Sting was I remember he and Warrior were together down. Well, I forget what they called them. Blade Runners. Blade Runners down in UWF, right? I think it was. Yeah. With Watts, and uh, Warrior had just left. And then we knew they were copying our gimmick. It was two muscle guys coming up trying to follow Hawk and I. We, it was cool. They did kind of like frilly type paint. We were all black and red and white. Except I'm in Philly. I got the Flyers colors on today. Right. But so, and then Warrior went to WWF. Okay. 
Sting was left by himself. And I tell you what, what a great guy, Jim Crockett. A lot of people don't like Jimmy Crockett. Jimmy Crockett came to me and said, listen, he goes, you ever heard of this Sting guy? One of the painted guys down at UWF? I said, yeah, I've seen him. He goes, the blonde hair, right? He goes, yeah. I said, we're thinking about bringing him in, but we want to know what you think because we don't want to interrupt your marketing or anything else because we let Jimmy keep all our marketing stuff. We just came in for the guaranteed contract. He let him keep all the marketing money, which was a big mistake. We should have kept that too. <laughs> but we said, I said, you know what? Let me think about it. And so I thought about it the rest of the night. I said, you know, Jimmy, bring Sting in. We'll call him a brother in paint, and we'll let him do six mans with Hawk and I. So that's what they did. If you remember for a while, he was six-man partner with Will Hawk and I for a while. And then Dusty, after he, he got over in the NWA, then Dusty moved him off with Flair. Then he, then he was off and running. That's a huge rub to give to somebody. Like, did you, did well, you know? Yeah, we, we didn't rub with anybody. Right. The only one person we ever tagged with at the time was Dusty. Right. He did you know his partner. personality beforehand? Did, didn't did you, even know who he was. So you, it was just a blind? I never met him before. It was just a blind rub. The only other story I ever heard of Sting was when... Uh, Dick Slater shoved his head in the toilet or something. Right. Yeah, for Dark Journey. Yeah, it's for Dark Journey thing, right? Yeah. That's the only time I ever heard of a guy named Sting. I said, really? I, th I thought it was a singer. <laughs> I didn't even know what his name was, to be quite honest with you. Because, you know, Watts wasn't on cable TV yet or none of that, so we never saw those guys. And we were on TBS and in Atlanta. We never heard. And we, you know, Oli would send us into Watts to help Watts out. I didn't know what his name was. I interviewed Luger, uh, and I interviewed... A uh, few others who said that his ego was the worst. Stings? No, Luger. Oh, Luger it's was pretty bad. I mean, we would listen. We would go out to restaurants. Say, say we were going to a Ruth Chris. Luger would or an Odo bar that night, and this is <laughs> so funny. We, you know, I I got the bandana on my head, a t-shirt, and jeans and tennis shoes. Luger's got the freaking ostrich skin boots. <laughs> This freaking skinny jeans before the worst skinny jeans, right? right? And and he had the tight shirt with the V-neck, so he could see his big gold chain and cross. And he's always putting on that Johnson's baby lotion with oil in it. I said, "What are you doing, man?" He goes, "I gotta put on my sheen before I go in the bar." I said, "We're going into a restaurant." Bro, it's freaking Denny's. When you put lotion <laughs> on for Denny's, come on. And I rip him about it today because I do a lot of appearances with Lex now. Right. And he and I joke about it. Man, oh, man, man. It's just, yeah, that was Lex. Lex was up there pretty good. But, you know, every once in a while in the wrestling business, I tell you, the great equalizer to bring somebody down to freaking earth was Hawk. Hawk could bring guys down to earth real quick. Physically or just intimidate them? Just would say, hey, you know. If you think your crap don't stink, bro, I'll, I'll show you it stinks. Right. That was just Hawk, you know? Because, you know, it's kind of funny. The guys that were, let me, how can I put that this way? The guys that knew how to handle themselves were pretty much all friends. Like, I never had an issue with Haku. You know, he never had one with Hawk and I or or a guy like Steiner, who could, Rick Steiner today, he could tie in a freaking knot. Right. Dr. Death Steve Williams was another badass, you know? We all were buddies. It's like the guys that all knew, like Godfather, that all knew what was going on. And all, you know, I call them the kind of guys that look at somebody when they go into do a bar and they, they look from here to here. Well, what's how, what's the difference in this guy's ear to his chin? Because if I have to throw a punch, I need to know where I'm throwing <laughs> it. You know, how many inches do I got to hit? But that's just you're in that protection mode all the time. Yeah, it's not like you're the toughest guy in the world. That ain't it. It's your product, your environment. It's what you grow up with. Yeah. You know? We were talking about this earlier about legitimate tough guys. Because it doesn't, pro wrestling doesn't necessarily breed legitimate tough yeah. guys. Um, Let me tell you something. Now, Bart Gunn was no slough either. Right. And everybody across the board agrees that Haku was the toughest. Mm. Tell you a story about Haku. Kurt Henning was the biggest river joker around. Right? Mr. Perfect. We're in this place in St. Louis called the Oz. Back when discos were real big. And we are right in the middle of, and I'm going to say it, it's an all-black East St. Louis neighborhood. Okay. We're the only <laughs> white guys in this disco. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Henning starts a fight with, I think these guys were either Bloods or Crips? And, oh, crap, here we go. And now we start seeing, like, 
10 of us are coming around. So we see that, and, and Henning, I can tell by Henning's looks, they, I've known him since high school. He gives you the Iggy, right, that, hey, man, I'm going to need some help here, you know? <laughs> right. Next thing you know, bro, and the, the saying in our business, do not give the island guys any booze. <laughs> you give a tongue and booze, like here in Barbarian, I was like in Baltimore one time, Barbarian walked down the hallway and put a headbutt through about 15 spots in the, in the days in, right across from the uh, Baltimore Civic Center. <laughs> Cops came and he just went like this before they even got there. He was sat there like this. Because <laughs> they told him he couldn't drink anymore after 2 o'clock. Well, Haku, all kind of comes by me like a blur. Now, I knew Haku from, he did sumo in Japan and we got into wrestling business and he would speak Japanese to the Japanese boys. All of a sudden, he gets his, the head guy down for whatever gang they were, and he went like that. And, bro, he had his finger behind the guy's eye and told him, said, brother, I'm going to eat that eyeball if you don't stop. Tell your boys to stop. Which kind of pretty much, I don't want to say saved all our butts, but we didn't really have to do anything. After right. Haku did that, everybody backed off and left. Right. So, yeah, that's that was Haku. Haku, I would say... If there's anybody in a wrestling business that would never I'd want to have to fight, it would be Haku. Right. What about Sags? Sags is another deceiving one, bro. Sags <laughs> hits like a freaking mule. Right. He, beat, he beat up, and I hate to say it, Kenny Shamrock's a good friend of mine. He beat up Shamrock. I don't know if it was Scott Hall or, or Nash. He ran after Nash. Nash didn't want to fight him one time. Sags don't care. Right. He's your typical Pennsylvania guy from Allentown that doesn't give a crap. You know, and he's another one of those Slavic guys. I think well, he's a Yugoslavian or something like that, right? Yeah. I think. And, uh, you know, Sag is another guy that's just is a big guy, man. And he's a big, fat. See, that's the thing <laughs> in our business. People don't realize how fast the big guys can actually get. Because like you say, a lot, they're all athletes in one way, form, or another. Yes, you have to. And be. they can go where they need to go. Right. You know? Do you see an old-time uh, tag team in, in, when you saw the Dudley boys for the first time? Speaking of uh, tough guys. Do I see them as an old school tag team? At the time, when, when they're breaking into the business and, and, they're, and they're rising through the ranks, they're, they're, they go off on their own. And it's no longer a comedy act. It's just Bubba and Devon. Mm -hmm. They start to travel Japan. They start racking up world title wins. Um, do you see them as like someone who would have thr a team that would have thrived in your era when, when, when teams mattered? Or... You know, the thing with, here's the thing with my era, and I think this has to do with the timing of the wrestling business. When you let a team, like, Bubba used to be the booker for TNA, right? right? When you let a guy that's in the business in the office, after that it never works. You got to have a guy that's one of the boys not in the office, because it's hard to separate... I can't push myself because I'm an office guy. You know what I'm saying? Right. Now, if he wasn't in the office and he was with us, they probably would have been a great team to be associated with all the other great teams. You know, you had Midnight, you had Steiners, you sure. had Us, Demolition. Rock and Roll. Rock and Roll. You had even, even Power and Glory was a great misused team. Mm -hmm. You know, you had a lot of guys. But I, a lot of guys don't like Paul Roma. I like I actually like Paul Roma. He was pretty decent to me, you know. But, but I... A lot of it's attitude because the problem is if you have an attitude, there's a lot of attitude adjusters right. in our business. You know, and back in our day, guys wouldn't have hesitated in the back to add, adjust your attitude. Now today they can't because they're all on a contract and if you're fighting WWE, they fire you and all. Right. But back then, you would never get fired. That's the way you handled business. I mean, I watched Wahoo McDaniel slap Jimmy Crockett because he screwed him on the payday. Right. You know, and stuff like that. But... Not, I'm not saying that they would have gotten fights. I, I, I think because they're so respectful of the old time way it was, I think Bubba and Devon would have been great back in that time period. To be honest with you, I would have loved to have had a team like that back there because really, Hawk and I really had nobody to work with at the time. Right. Nobody physically on your no, own. No, I mean, because we pretty much powered, I mean, even Sting and Luger, when we turned heel on them, we got standing ovations all over the country. Right. We didn't have any team that could make us people think, God, we could hurt these guys. Right. You know? We, we we talked about this a little before the cameras started rolling. Do you think uh, that it's an ego thing, like when you hear them call themselves the greatest tag team ever with the, the, um, the amount of titles and stuff like that? Or do you think that's just uh, all a part of the business and part of the mm -hmm. show? 
I think it depends who it is. I think some guys can't let the show part away or the ego part away. Right. I think some guys egotistically think they're one of the best team or the best person or whatever. I don't know per se. I, I just know for me, when I say it, I'm I'm kidding around. I'm ribbing, you know. Um, even though fans like yourself and people, every everything you see in wrestling, the greatest team of all time is the Road Warriors, right? Even though they say that, I'm a realist, but, you know, listen, the guys, if I didn't have Harley Races and Stan Hansen and Briscoes and guys like that to lay down for me, I wouldn't be where I'm at. Right. That, that's... I, w- I wouldn't have that credibility. And I think that probably is okay. It's okay. Who, who'd you beat? Who laid down for you? And there's a difference in a 10-year span there of different guys doing jobs for different guys. You know what I mean? Now, I, I think those guys would be great, man. I mean, they're both great guys, you know. And, you know, Bubba, if you see this, I'm telling you, you're a great guy. Don't get mad at me. You know, but I've always respected other guys. Listen, anybody that, that stays a tag team that long, I respect them. Now, I don't like when they split them up. I didn't like the Bully Ray thing when he was by himself. I don't like that because they're a great team. Right. You know what I mean? And uh, I don't know whose idea that was at the office to do that, but... I think it would have been better just for them to stay a team. I think they could have worked for a long time as a team together. Do you think ever uh, an ego will get out of control and one of the teammates will think that, hey, I can go on and be, I don't need my partner. I can go well, on and do I'm, I'm sure things. that happens with a lot of people. Right. I mean, you know, I mean, I hate to say it, but when, when Hawk was all messed up on drugs, you know, when he ended up quitting at the SummerSlam, I continued dates on behalf of WWF. Right. Right. So when I did, I took the double suplex from the Beverly Brothers and I heard he had a couple of discs. Now, I could have went on and just babied it and, and finished wrestling, but Hawk had quit at that time and Hawk decided, oh, hey, I'm going to go to Japan, be together with Kensuke, Power Warrior, and it's going to be great. Well, shit, six months later, the phone calls start coming right away. Right. I said, man, you did that. I said, listen, man, I'm collecting an insurance saying I can't do anything for two years. So I collected everything for two years. Then I could do something. Did that drive you crazy? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Choke it on pizza crust. Water. <coughs> well, what drove me crazy about it was the di- Hawk's mind was so gone by that was the disrespect. He wanted me just to quit with him cold turkey and leave. And I wasn't about burning the bridge. I didn't want to burn the bridge because you never know who you got to come back and work for, right? Even though they say you can't burn a bridge in this business, I wanted to finish out our dates with WWF. So that's what I did. So I knew they had a European tour and a Japan tour coming up, and I wanted to be on both of them because we were over in both countries. So I really wanted to go do the tours. It would be stupid for me not to. Right. And I wanted to do that. And I did it, and I think in the, in the U.K. or somewhere or in Japan, they had Crush was my partner one time, and then I did a handicap. Against both the Beverly Brothers, you know, came through the curtain in the Tokyo Dome with a big fake bazooka that went off and stuff like that. So yeah, it it, it, was, it was fun, but I, I knew that my money in the future was always going to be with Hawk, right? My big money. And then when Hawk had his little run with the Power Warrior, they started calling me back, and I walked down to the Tokyo Dome one time when uh, Hawk and Kensky were wrestling somebody. I was was their third. I was just kind of painting the picture that okay. You can see me now physically. I'm back because I was freaking probably one of the biggest I ever was at that time in the Tokyo Dome. And you can hear the fans start chanting, you know, animal, 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 you know, animal in Japanese. And so then, you know, okay, it's ready. Right. So that's when I came back, you know, and Kensuke went off. I came over to a six man against the Steiners and, and uh, Scott Norton against Hawk and I and Kensuke. And then after that, Hawk and I just took off on ourselves again. Right. Being, always being a consummate professional, like it seems like you were at, at, at all costs. Yeah, and, I, I like to be the professional with that business because you never know when you got to come back and do something else. But I think I just got, like we talked about before, I got wrapped into the crap, the nonsense that Hawk was doing Right. that kind of blacklisted me a little bit. And, you know, 
you're guilty by association. And it's just the way the name of the game when you're someone like we are. Well, I mean, the, the wealth of knowledge, even sitting here and talking, like, I mean, it, it just flows from you and you seem like you're an amazing communicator. And being excommunicated by the WWE right now, I mean, that that pretty much boils down to a slap in the face. So well, I mean, it's a slap in the face, to be honest with you. It's like kind of like a kick in the nuts, to be quite honest. Right. I mean, I don't want to get vulgar here with it, but, but you know, see, I... I made deals with both the NWA and WWE. They knew I was a coach. I coached all my kids in sports. I'm a coach at heart. I love coaching. If I didn't do this business, I would be a college football coach somewhere. Right. At, at a major D1 college because I love coaching sports. I love teaching a young athlete. Not that I'm Newt Rockney or nothing, you know, or, or Vince Lombardi, but I like teaching them the proper way to do techniques. I made it work for both my sons. My daughter skated with the U.S. Women's Olympic team for a couple of years. My son played pro ball. Right. I mean, I know what I'm doing as far as training young athletes. I mean, it's not like I just said, okay, my philosophy is the best. No, I research Olympic training. I research pro football training. I research your your body types, your endo, meso, ectomorph, your different body types, which training helps you for that body type and everything else. So I, I love doing that stuff, and that's why I really got kind of like you say, man, the kick in the nuts when I said, listen, I'll go down to, I'll move to Florida and do the training center for you. How much more do you want me to say? When you say that, who, who are you communicating that to? Your brother? I told that to my brother and I told that to Dusty. Right. Because Dusty was running the training center. Right. Dusty. Threw and you my, always had a good relationship with Dusty. Oh, Dusty and I were like this, man. Right. He, he used to call Hawk and I his babies. Oh, come on, here's my babies and my pit bulls. Come on. And, you know, he loved us because he, he knew that we were rough around the edges but Dusty knew where we were coming from because, listen, Dusty and Slater were the, were the thing. They were not, another great tag team. Dusty Rhodes and Dick Slater. Sure. You know? And uh, so he knew that we had, Dusty could see the potential on us before we could even see it as far as interviews go. Because then we start doing all these cable stations and then all these cable stations start requesting Hawk and I to do promos. And when they start asking for you to do them, we said, God, we got something here, you know? And then the guys backstage will call us the one cut kids because we never had to redo a promo twice. Right. And we we're easy sell. We were a hard sell. Watch this channel. Watch this company. Bam, bam, bam. Oh, what a rush. Bam. You know, and it, it was a natural to us. Yeah, but I always got to go along good with Dusty, man. And I never really understood why they never brought me in. I, I couldn't understand it. I mean, you're still, you could still be brought in now. I still could be brought in now. Listen, you, most of the coaches that work there now don't even get in the ring. They tell the guys what to do, and they have someone else demonstrate it. I mean, as far as tag team philosophy and stuff, listen, philosophy is not changed in the wrestling business. Right. Still good guy, bad guy, no matter what you're doing in the wrestling business. The moves have changed a little bit. You may have good against good and bad against bad, but you got to figure out who's going to be the ring general in the ring and lead the other one to make them look better than they can look themselves. Right. But there's a disconnect now with, with, with fans. Yeah. There's well, a big disconnect. Fans with, with... are confused. Right. They're really confused right now. They don't know. Okay, perfect example. Love the guy. Looks phenomenal. Look at Roman Reigns. Why in the world the fans would boo him, I don't know. Looks great. Works his rear end off. But there's something about the first couple months, I don't know if you guys noticed, that the writers were giving them such stupid promos that they buried the poor guy. Right. I mean, I saw him one time say, suffer and suck a tash in a promo. <laughs> That's what Sylvester the Cat said in a Tweety Bird cartoon. Right. <laughs> and I, I, said, I said, why is he saying that? He's a freaking Samoan. Let him get pissed off and start swearing in Samoan. You know, they can relate to that from the Wild Samoans and then the Usos and then Rikishi and all the other, Umanga and all these other great Samoans, you know, Rodney, all these great Samoans that came through the ranks, man. You can just let him be a Samoan. Sure. Shit, he's Rock's cousin. Let him be a Samoan. How can Vince not feel the disconnect with fans? Is he so, is he, is he, has time passed him by? Is he, is he, is he disconnected with the business now? You know, I don't know what it is with Vince, man. I, I, I kind of questioned that myself. I, you know, I I saw him back after, um, what was it? I think 2012, the year after we got inducted in the Hall of Fame. And I was backstage, and he kind of, now how do you not even remember who I look like? I'm walking by you. I got the mohawk. And, Wait, he didn't remember you? But he looked at me like he was just glazing his eyes, and 
And he was like, kind of like halfway not there. And I didn't know if you had a little bit too much to drink or what was going on. But I said, man, it's Joe Laurinaitis. Oh, oh, Joe. What? I'm going, really? <laughs> my brother works for you. Come on, you know. He, he came to the Hawks' funeral down at my, my, my dad's house, you know. Right. And, uh, yeah, it was just, you know, it was really kind of weird. And ever since then, I see Vince. And he, yeah, I, I, I've not seen him for a, a couple years now. But, uh, you know, and the funny thing now with the new company, everybody knows Hunter runs it pretty much. Okay. And I have no heat with Paul whatsoever. I don't have any heat with Stephanie. Now, did I try to contact them when I was getting frustrated when they wouldn't hire me for a job? Absolutely. I said, you keep the same guys around for 50 years. I said, I hate to tell you, but the 50-year-old, 50, 50 guy has been there for 50 years. His ideas are freaking getting kind of pretty much obsolete. Right. Did you make contact with them? Did oh, yeah. I tried, I tried to. But, man, they, they, but, you know, my brother would come back to me and say, what are you emailing Stephanie for? What are you emailing this guy? I said, really? So your brother's playing middleman and he's taking the WWE side. All the time. He, my brother, John, is an office guy. And nothing against him. Hey, right. I'll, I love him. He's an office guy all the way. And that's just the way he is. That's the guy that pays his check. Was it was it like that when you were younger too? Did you see that? Uh, I mean, he 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 was in the business. He was a worker. You know, when uh, my brother John and my brother Mark wanted to get into wrestling, you know, they both went to the same college in Minnesota. They got out. John was a basketball player. My brother Mark was a football player. Mark went on to have the Wrecking Crew thing. They were right. WCW champs and spent more time in Germany than anything else. You know, it's, I think it was too close a gimmick too. They wore the face paint and everything else too, but Johnny. I, I here's what I did for my brothers. A the first thing is that I paid my brothers. Don't even know this. I paid for both of them to go through Nelson Royals camp in hmm. Charlotte. You didn't tell them? No, they thought they got it for free. I, I paid them. Wow. I paid for them to go through. I paid uh, Jimmy Crockett. He paid Nelson Royal. Okay, and then second, um, I asked Giant Baba. I said, "Listen, you guys are really big on family for all Japan." I said, "How about you want to do a brothers tag team?" I have a brother, Mark, and my brother, Johnny. Now, Johnny already had the dynamic dudes thing. I said, Mark was already a Terminator. I said, let's bring them both over. I brought them both over. Well, next thing you know, their pictures are on the front page of every magazine, everything over there, videos and everything over there, right? I said, I'll open the door. It's up for you to walk through now. I can't walk through it for you. Johnny did. Johnny took off in Japan. John, I, one thing I will say, Johnny was over like a son of a gun in Japan, man. Mrs. Baba loved my brother, hmm. loved my brother, and uh, and took care of him real well. And Johnny had a good 12-year career there. Right. You know, and Mark went off with his, his buddy Al, and they did the wrecking crew thing over in Germany for about 10 years, and they both had good careers, you know. How did, uh, how did he end up becoming an, uh, a WWE office worker? You know, uh, Johnny was real good friends with uh, Dallas Page. Okay. When there was an opening to come in from uh, All Japan into WCW, Johnny did that. He came in, bam. Then when Vince did the big buyout, the buyout was like not even like six months after Johnny got hired, Vince brought Johnny in and says, you're the finish guy, huh? He goes, oh, well, I want to hire you to be my finish guy and brought Johnny in for the finish guy. Hmm, just like that. Yeah, just like that. <laughs> he, there were certain guys he wanted, to, like when they did the takeover, they wanted the, the Steiners and they wanted, of course, me and Hawk, and that was about the only talent they really wanted at the time. You know, Flair didn't want to go to them. Right. WCW, they tried to do their own thing. They thought they're going to other other sponsor, and they didn't get another sponsor or any other money behind them. Right. So we stayed with the WWF. So we'll wrap this up soon. I don't want to spend the entire interview on politics, but just to just to uh, fast forward a little bit. So your brother's in the office. He confronts you about emailing Stephanie and Shane. And uh, do you feel, I mean, a little... Well, I didn't get Shane's email. It was just pretty much it was Stephanie. Stephanie. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so he confronts you about emailing Stephanie. And uh, he's basically, I mean, from what it sounds like, yelling at you in a way? Like, what are you well, doing? Well, kind of like scolded me a little bit. And, of course, you know, I mean, I'm one of the You're boys. You're a road warrior animal. I'm huh? one of the boys, and I basically jump back and say, listen, I mean, don't yell at me at what I'm doing, bro. I said, these people told me I would have a job when I want to retire. Right. I want to retire. Did Vince tell um, you that? Vince told me himself. I shook his hand backstage at one of the rinks, and I said, listen, my ultimate goal is to be working for you behind the scenes trying to teach, you how, teach young talent how to be a great 
W, it was WWF star type. Right. Great WWF and star. And that's not a selfish move on no, your part. No, man. I want to give what I... Listen, I wrestled with Hawk main events for 22 years right. before Hawk died. Even after Hawk passed away, I still came back and did the thing with Heinrich and won the belts as wrestling main events with that part of it. Right. It's not like I didn't know what was going on. I mean... I actually had, it wasn't with Hog, but, you know, NWA, AWA, WWF, and WWE. Right. You know, all the four big ones, you know. And, and I did that, and I, I said, listen, I got a lot to offer these young boys, man. And I went down to the training center once for two weeks and helped train guys. I thought it was great. I mean, you know, uh, Skinner, uh, Steve was running it for a while, and he said, man, you did a great job. And I helped the guys out with their promos and everything else. And, you know, and that's the part that's a little bit, irritating with you because now and I'm not going to mention any names but now you got guys that used to run cameras down there that are booking and running NXT when you got guys that were, are in the Hall of Fame that learned by for 30 years by the best guys in the business that you got sitting at home doing nothing right I mean figure that out right I don't care how much you've been around the business watching it with a camera you still don't know what it's like until you get in that squared circle you get in that squared circle then you know what it's like to feel that temperature of what's going on, to feel that rush, to know when it's time to start beating the crap out of somebody or know when it's time to lay there and let the guy get it on you. You know, you got to know that, man. It's a, it's a thing that's learned, that's a trait that needs to be taught with, to the other guys. When I was there, I got to work with guys like um, uh, Haku's younger son. That's one of the Bullet Club guys. Um, I got to work with uh, Mason Ryan, who mm -hmm. was a big monster. Teach those guys, Big E, Big mm -hmm. E was there, mm -hmm. taught him how to be a big guy and being able to be a big guy that can sell at the same time to help them out for their future in the wrestling business. I'm not going to teach him how to be a road warrior. Right. You can't teach somebody how to be a Bruno or a road warrior or an Andre or a Hulk Hogan. You can't teach that. You can't teach somebody how to be a Ric Flair. Right. There's certain entities in our business that I think that the wrestling business should leave alone. Don't touch it. Because if you start comparing other guys and they have to do promos, well, I'm going to drop the big leg like Hulk Hogan and my leg was better than Hulk Hogan's. Well, now you just bury yourself because you're trying to compare yourself to Hogan. Or, you know, if the Road Warriors are on our path, like Ascension, if the Road Warriors are on our path, we'll knock them off the train track. Well, <laughs> come on, man. Right. Listen. Right. You put the Ascension pictures next side by side, next to Hawk and I side by side. Right. Really? Right. You, we don't even have that say, man. I don't have to open my mouth up. They, People would, be just go, they would be enhancements. Oh, talent. but yeah, you, you guys... <laughs> Listen, the Hardys took the doomsday off our shoulders when they first started. Right. Look what they became. You know, they've, now they're a top duo and top singles in the wrestling business, you know. So guys will start somewhere. But, yeah, you, you, there's certain entities, I think, in the wrestling business. You need to leave it alone and let it lie. Let them go off into their freaking their twilight years and in the rest of their life being the man. Right. You shouldn't try to, you shouldn't try to copy their gimmick, their moves. Nothing, because the wrestling fan, let me tell you something, some of the smartest fans in the world and the most educated are wrestling fans about this business. Now, they may not be able to add up 10 plus 10, <laughs> but they know they're wrestling, man. Right. And that's why I love them, man, because they're, they're inner city people, they're street people, they love this business, they're hardcore, and that's why I love wrestling fans. Right. Well, I guess we're never really going to know because we can't, we can't mind read, so we're never going to know, but... It's a shame coming from uh, someone, in my humble opinion, that because most people, I don't think anybody in your position, there's a lot of people who really want to give back, who really want to do the things you want to do, because it's not an ego trip for hey, you. I can go back and just coach somewhere at a college and yeah. be just fine. But I, listen, at this point in my career, that's why I do a lot of the cons. I do a lot of the Comic Cons, and I will go to some indie shows. I like to give back to the fans. See, Hawk and I were so untouchable. You couldn't even touch our spikes. You couldn't do nothing. You couldn't even get close to us. Security would kill you or we would kill you, run you over with all that stuff fun, right? Right. And now they get to come. I get to go to a con. You get to put on my spike shoulder pads. I say, hi, how you doing? Talk to you a bit. How's your kid? Whatever, whatever. And they see that I'm a human being on the other side. of it. Man, I got grandkids now. Right. You know, so, you know, it, it's a humbling. To me, it's humbling to have these people respect you this much. This many years later, I mean, Hawk's, Hawk's going to be dead 15 years next year. Mm. That people respect you that much, you did something right. 
going back to your early days when you were when you were breaking into the business and you were first introduced to the politics that happened backstage at wrestling, coming from a, a, a legitimate tough guy, legitimate athlete, and you see politicking in the back. How, how did how did you handle that? You know, uh, when I first went to the Carolinas, I I took it as a learning experience, right? Then. We learn things the hard way, and I, and I laugh when I say this because, like, I'll never forget, I got in the ring one time with Mr. Wrestling number two. Mm. Uh, huh? Johnny yeah. Walker. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. It was Johnny Walker, and then it was... Uh, Landon? No, it was somebody else, oh, man. Grappler. Yeah, I, it was somebody Thanks, else. Thanks, Rob. But I, I, think, I think it was <laughs> either Johnny Walker, I think Wahoo McDaniels, and I guess Hawk and I, and we were heels. And I, bro, I was so ignorant, I never even knew that Johnny Walker's finish was the high knee. Right. I never watched Johnny Walker. I didn't even know who, I didn't know who Mr. Wrestling was. I knew Mr. Wrestling number one was, Tim <laughs> Woods. I never even heard of Mr. Wrestling number two. I didn't have cable. Right. I'm an inner city kid, didn't have dick, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, yeah. So I'm sitting there, and he gives me the high knee, and I don't even move on it. I'm saying, well, this guy is about 5'6". I'm not going to move on this leg. So the next high knee came and hit me right in the mouth. And then I got a split lip. And I said, ah, now I get it. Right. Now I get it. It's respecting. It's politics in this business. This guy is over. You got to sell. I'll tell, you what, I'll tell you another quick story. I'm in Charlotte. Now, Rick Rude and I had to wrestle each other. My very first match was against Rick Rude, my friend. 20-minute Broadway. When they told us 20-minute Broadway in the back, I looked at him and I said, I said, what's a Broadway? He goes, I don't know, about 185. I, you know, <laughs> I, said, I said, what's a Broadway? And the referee had to tell us, Tommy Young, it's a tie. Right. I said, oh. I said, 20 minutes? God dang, man, we never went over eight minutes in our camp. We, in the first five minutes, did everybody's finish. I got yelled at me for doing everybody's finish, right? That was my first experience. My second experience is that the next night, they put me, I'll never forget it, Fayetteville. And I'm, I'm sitting there with Don Carnoodle and Sergeant Slaughter. Now, this is after me starving, and I've already lost like 25 pounds. And thank God Sergeant Slaughter bought me a cheeseburger from Burger I'll never forget, bought me a cheeseburger from Burger King that day. <laughs> and I had, a, I had some protein in me for a change. You know, I was living on pretzel sticks, like I said. Mm. And I got to wrestle um, Johnny Weaver. And I said, oh, crap. So they gave me the finish. They said, Johnny Weaver's going to put you to sleep in the middle of the ring. And I'm sitting there like this, and... Now, now, now that I know this, but Canoodle is digging me on. He goes, Joe, you're going to get put to sleep by Johnny Weaver? <laughs> and finally, after about 15 minutes saying it, I said, I know, right? Who's going to believe that? <laughs> His arms won't even fit around my neck. No, I said, nobody is going to believe that Johnny Weaver can put me to sleep. Well, little did I know, Johnny Weaver, I mean, shit, he wrestled Andre. Right. You know? And all of a sudden, I'm beating up Johnny Weaver, and Johnny Weaver knew exactly what to do. And all of a sudden, Johnny Weaver raises his hands up and does one of these. And the wrestling fans in Fayetteville start coming unglued. <laughs> what happened? He put me to sleep. <laughs> you right, know? Right. So I learned that kind of politicking. A, shut your mouth, do your job, and then things are going to happen if you keep your nose clean and keep with intestinal fortitude and you know, and you got to be in the right situation too, man. It's all about being in the right situation. Good things will happen. How do you think Animal Hawk, your young kids now with this same fire, starting in the wrestling business today? Do you think you'd be able to adapt? Oh, bro! If we were in the business today, we would sell more merchandise than anybody in the company. I agree with probably. that. Probably because we were just so different. We, we could be those guys you could throw on commercials. How do you think you'd adapt, though, to the scripted style as it is today, more of a, more of a sitcom -y TV show as opposed to gritty realism that well, you did? I think if you, if you did it the same way, if we would have already been wrestling for like eight years before we come into your company, I think you know that our feet were already grounded by that per se. And I think you'd have to adhere to what our gimmick what is for it to be money for you. Right. If you really try to reinvent it, like, I don't know, man. There's, there's, one, there's one thing you can't teach. You can't teach charisma. And that's one thing Hawk and I had. Right. We had charisma on the mic. You can give us a scripted interview. 
we're going to ad lib it anyway and say it the way I would say it. But you'd catch heat for that. No, no, but you can get the same point across. It's the delivery and the line. Right. Sometimes you can tell when a guy's reading off a projector right there and a Chiron right there in front of you. That he was, he's not looking at the camera for one. He's looking off to the side. You can, so you can tell right away. Right. But if he's reading off it, you can tell he's reading it line by line. Now, I, we would look at that, look at that, look at that, and then we say, okay, we're ready to go. Boom. And have that thought in my head that I got to hit this point. So however you hit the point is the main, main thing. Right. If now, not, did, did you learn that over time, or was that innate? You know, that kind of just came natural for us, because here's what we did. I became the hard sell guy. I would wrap everything up that everybody did. Hawk would talk. Actually, I was going to say wrap it up. I would start off with everything everybody did, and we're going to get you back, this and that, and this and that. Tell them, Hawk. Well, Hawk would go strictly talk about nothing that mattered. You know, you snack on danger and dine on death. The dead men don't make money. Right, right Paul? <laughs> and Paul would wrap everything up with the Wall Street Journal. Boom, boom, boom. So it worked cool together because here you had these two big muscle helm buffoons and you had a little guy manager who controlled us, which was, people were going, how does he control these guys? Right. You know, because if you watch some of the videos of us going over to Japan, we literally did a video one time. We poured all this tomato sauce on top of a deer carcass out in the woods, and it shows us coming up to the deer carcass like this, and then the next shot you see is I got tomato sauce all over my face going like this. <laughs> <laughs> Look at our fingers. And do you know how many people still ask me to say, animal son, you eat dead deer? <laughs> Heck yeah, man. It's still warm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they don't believe it, you know? Right. And Hawk in the video ate 16 raw eggs in the shell. <laughs> Who does that? <laughs> But we did it because, shit, we used to do that kind of crap before wrestling. Right. You know, so it was like nothing new to us. And we were just like, did off-the-wall stuff like that. Never dreamed you could incorporate it into the wrestling business or a wrestling game, man. But I think, I think if we had it today, when you see a team like, uh, I, lo- I, 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 have, I happen to like New Day. I like New Day. I think they're funny as heck. Okay? Talented guys. I think... They do have to break Big E away from the other two, though. I think it's about that time. It's almost kind of getting monotonous yes, now, right? Yes, yes. Okay? But if you gave Hawk and I that copper opportunity because, you know, to have, like, a, a Budios type thing or a LOD crunch or something like that cereal-wise, because when I look back and see all the stuff we sold as far as bed sheets and... Lo- you were I, on a cereal I, box. I know, but that was, that was made by... Ralston Perino. Yes, though. Ralston. That, was, that yes. wasn't. That wasn't really. That was probably more like dog food than it was cereal. <laughs> you know. No, but when I looked at it, I still have lunch boxes at home with Hawk and I and Ultimate Warrior on the front. Mm-hmm. You know, and Hulk Hogan. And so, when you look at that stuff, you say, "God dang, man! Look how far ahead of our time we were." You know, and pillowcases and bed sheets and all that kind of kind of stuff and ancillary rights and all that stuff. I said, "Man, could you imagine if that was today?" The guys today, I hear, are making more on that than they do on the wrestling. I believe it. And if that's the case, who cares? Money's money. It doesn't right. matter where it comes from. Pay the boys. You know? And so I'm, I'm happy for them. They're making money. Like, I don't hold any grudges. I'm not pissed I didn't come out in this era. Nothing like that. I'm just mad that and dis, more disappointed. And like you say, it's like a kick in the gut that I have a lot to add to this business. For whoever's running a company, if it ain't WW or whatever's running a company right now, that I could teach guys in the back and teach teams. We're getting ready to open up in uh, St. Louis. My lawyer and I are talking about it, doing a um, Power Slam University. Okay. Road War Animals Power Slam University. And we're going to do the first one in St. Louis, and it's going to be a training center for guys. That want, and there's no training centers in the Midwest that are worth a damn to train guys how to do pro wrestling. You'll have an interview station there. You'll have two wrestling rings for one for the intermediate one for the more experienced you know and there are beginning learners to the intermediate and more experienced guys and teach these guys how to do interviews that make sense that are that they got to think for themselves because one thing I've learned in the wrestling business there are a million of different personalities you can't have the same writer telling the same guys what to say because their delivery is going to be different because they're different personalities Look back in our time, from Snooker to Hogan to Orndorff to Piper to Hawk and I to Flair, Andre, Demolition, Powers of Pain, Jim Cornette, all 
everybody's personality and delivery was different. You can't have everybody be the same. Right. That's, I think, the trap they've fallen into because everybody is kind of like the same a little bit. They are. They, I think they're letting guys that branch out a little bit more, like they're giving Seth Rollins a little bit more leeway, which they should because I think that Seth Rollins is probably the future of that company, you know, because he's a great performer. But, you know, other guys, you could just tell they're reading off the script too much and that's not necessarily good. Listen, I'll tell you one guy I respect that wasn't going to put up with the crap there was Ryback. Yeah. Ryback said, hey, man, you push me, you get me over, then you have me getting beat by everybody. What mm-hmm. the heck's that? I'm the best built guy in the company. Which, he's right. They had a, they had a lot of potential for him. Yeah, bro, he could have. Listen, he was like the, the road warrior of today. Mm-hmm. If they would have built him out to be a killer instead of having him get beat all the time, just think of where he could be. Yeah. He'd be your main event guy. You could have him being believable against Brock. I agree. You know what I mean? You so, mentioned Paul Ellering. That's another thing that's lost on today's fans is the art of the manager. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit. I know I know he was actually a real-life manager. Like, he handled business for you. But yeah. away from that, um, the manager, the, the, the Bobby the Brain Heenans, the Jimmy Hart's, the guys that would help get people over – completely lost on today's fan. Oh, yeah. Why do you think that is? You know, I said the other day to somebody, somebody asked me what I thought about the Roman Reigns Brock Lesnar thing. I said, you know what I would have done in that match? I'd have had Paul Heyman turn on Lesnar and take Roman Reigns. Be Roman Reigns' mouth. Because Roman Reigns needs that mouth. And Paul Heyman is one of the best talkers ever in our business. Right. And I'll say that till the day I die. He is phenomenal. Right? So he... And, uh, you know, guys like Cornette that were strictly talkers. You can't right. get them in the ring because you'd freaking, people wouldn't believe that last two seconds in the ring. But could get guys over. We had Ella Ring who literally booked all our independent shows, got our flights, paid for our flights, got reimbursed by the promoter, paid for our hotels, got reimbursed by the promoter, did all that stuff for us. All we had to do was show up. So right. that's why when it came time to get the big contract with Crockett, we make sure Paul got taken care of. Sure. You know, so in that aspect of it, man, yeah, but that, that's a lost art, man. There are so many guys. Uh, I, I think a manager is a very integral part of some wrestling characters. Not everybody needs a manager, but guys like that would need like an Ellery. Right. Yeah. It's, it seems like the, the type of people who might, might be good behind the mic who can't um, flourish in the ring are not even given a shot. There's not even that genre of talent anymore that's even given an opportunity. Yeah, so it's, you're right. It's man. interesting. It's you're interesting. Right. You're right. Ellering's a, a class act, though. Right. I mean, you know, and I don't think you're ever going to see a guy. Now, there's a guy, Heyman, who does not go off the script. I don't think they even make him go off the script, and they shouldn't even try. Right. They probably say, he, he, You got what you're going to say? Okay, talk to me. Okay, that's what you're going to say. Cool. Because he is so freaking good. It's not just what he says, it's just how he says it. He says it like we're having a conversation right now right. to the fan. Right. And then he gets the fan so irate. Heck, I'm sitting there watching it, I want to hate him. Right. And I, you know, I know what he's doing. Right. You know, that's really good. When you can get the boys to go, holy crap, then you know you got something great there, man. Sure. So and he's got a great mind, man. I mean, you know, I think he did great with ECW and all that stuff, and you know, and I just think that you know, the wrestling business took a wild turn. I, I still think the wrestling business needs to have two or three major companies. I agree. I think it'd be great for business. I think it'd be great for everybody in it. It'd be great for the guys and girls that wrestle in it. And there wouldn't be such a stronghold on, on a lot of talent. You mentioned a lot of personalities earlier. You, also, you mentioned Andre the Giant. Recently had a uh, very moving HBO documentary I done saw about it. him. Uh, do you have any uh, particular memories or, or something about Andre you can add? You know, there's only two or three things with Andre. Uh, Once we uh, were coming back from Ribera Steakhouse in Tokyo. Now, this was before the second one was open. This was in Gotunda, the one that Ribera's dad dad had, right? Right. And we were coming back, and and Paul Ellering said to us, and we were walking back one night. We were off a couple days, and he says, I think there's a bar here called the Pink Pussycat. A lot of the guys used to stop here and go to. Japanese had the... The most ridiculous names for a lot of places. Right. That didn't even make sense. Also, we hear this music playing, and we hear this ho, 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 laughing. We <laughs> go in there, there's nobody in there except the owner of the bar, who we found out was Andre's girlfriend, and Andre's sitting in a little freaking chair 
that looked like a Barbie chair. Right. You know, his, his not even one butt cheek fit on the chair, right? <laughs> and and it was Andre. That was our first time meeting Andre. And of course, you know, here we come in with the bandanas, and he knew right away who we were. You know, and well, of course, who doesn't know the giant, right? Right. Second time was when uh, when Demolition was jumping on when we first went to WWF. We came down and saved Andre, and then he ended up being in our corner when we would wrestle Demolition for right. a couple of matches. Then he was too sore with his knees and hips, and that's when he'd go. But I'll never forget, man. I was sitting on a I was sitting on the bus. You know, when you go over to the UK, you ride on a on a bus going over to um, town to town in London. And we were actually going from like Berlin to England somewhere. And I go to sit on the bus and right, the only seat left on the bus, because I overslept, was freaking next to Andre. <laughs> so now I got like a half of my own butt cheek on the seat because it was the booth, right? And Andre's sitting there and of course he's drinking a bottle of wine, which literally, it was a big bottle and this is his hand on the bottle of wine looking about that big. Right. Couldn't even see the label on the wine. His hands were so monstrous, right? And so I'm sitting there and behind me comes Flair. Now, Flair sees me sitting there late, and I'm 320. He comes in, and he starts cracking up. And I said, what are you laughing at, you idiot? Like that, because I have not known Flair for a lot of years. Right. He goes, you look like a ventriloquist dummy on Andre's knee. That's how big Andre was. Right. Andre was freaking monstrous, and just his head and his hands. You know, my hand was sitting next to his on a bar, and his, his looked like two of mine sitting there. And it, it, that was one of my other experiences with Andre, man. Then he made me go eat two Chinese dinners back to back because he wanted to go drink. <laughs> that was another one. Interesting. You, you, I just get done eating and he goes, "You boss, he called everybody boss, boss." Come here. Yeah, yeah, boss. Because you got to call him boss back. Right. And uh, he goes, uh, "You hungry?" I said, "Bro, I just got done eating a sizzling steak." He goes, "No, no, you need to eat more." I'm going, "Oh no, but nobody tells Andre no. You don't right. want to get him on the bad side." Yeah, so that's what I heard. So I was still relatively young. I said, "Okay, whatever you want to do, Andre, Andre, let's go." I went back again, and he drank two bottles of wine, and I had another sizzling steak dinner. And that was it. I said, now I'm stuffed. Now I want to go up and sleep for two days. I got so much red meat <laughs> right. in me. Right. I can't breathe right now, you right. know? Yeah, and that was my other, my third story with Andre, man. I, yeah, I, we got along good with Andre. Did everybody? Did people walk on tippy toes around him? Oh, yeah. yeah. If Andre didn't like you, man, he'd just slam you in the middle of the ring and sit on you and fart in your face. Right. He <laughs> would do that to guys. Really? Oh, yeah. What are you going to do? And a 500-pound ass in your face. You can't move it. In the documentary, they talk about if anybody who didn't belong in the locker room ever meandered back there, he would, he would make oh. sure they would leave. Oh, yeah. He'd scare them to death to kick them out. Right. Andre could move in his day. Yeah. I mean, he was fast for a big guy. Yeah. You know, I mean, you got to imagine, imagine what it was like to be seven foot four. you know? I can only imagine. You mentioned Ric Flair. Uh, Ric Flair ha uh, recently had some health uh, issues. We almost lost the Nature Boy. Mm -hmm. um, you were pretty much at your peak when he was at his peak. So he was the single star. He was the star to your tag team. Yeah. So yeah. when you were guys were riding, uh, was uh, when you guys were doing that, um, was the respect for the Road Warriors from Ric Flair? Oh yeah, man. Ric Flair organized my uh, first my bachelor party over in Tokyo for me, and uh, you know I bought home. I, his David Flair and Megan, his daughter, lived in Minnesota at the time, so I would bring back toys for David and Megan when they were, you know, like Japanese director sets for Christmas. And, and Flair's documentary was right on because he was never there for his kids. Right. So he knew I was going home, and I would bring back like a dozen Cabbage Patch dollars for Megan. And, you know, you can imagine me going through the airport with a bandana on my head with a mohawk, and I'm taking Cabbage Patch dolls. <laughs> right. Probably thinking, what this guy's going to do with Cabbage Patch dolls? Right. Is he a child molester or what, you know? <laughs> but we would get good prices on them in Japan, and I would do that for Flair. And, we'd, you know, be in the Minnesota thing, you know, and, you know, we had that connection there because he went through Vern's camp and everything else, and his, his, uh, his uh, parents lived in Golden Valley, Minnesota, which, which was one suburb away from where we lived. and So we had that connection. So we became fast friends. Of course, Hawk and I had a 1,000 matches with the four horsemen, too. Mm -hmm. And we always had six mans with, you know, Hawk and I had Dusty, and it would be Flair and Tully and Iron most of the sure. time. So we had a lot of those together, too, man. Yeah, it was... Flair was, Flair was always a consummate pro. I mean, I spent a lot of times... I spent a lot of time with Flair. I don't even want to stay on camera. <laughs> you know, of course, if you watch this 30 for 30, he pretty much summed it up what he did. So it's sure. not too much a secret, you know. But I was, I forget where I was the other day. He got mad at me. We were at a live event. And I told a story one time when we were flying over to, uh, from Puerto Rico to Portland, Oregon. And uh, 
it was, that, that's back when flight attendants were a little more laxed. <laughs> and uh, he asked me to grab his robe out of the upper cabinet and lo and behold, he went in the bathroom and got changed and all he had on was a robe and his alligator shoes. That was it. <laughs> Came out naked and... Now you guys commanded respect for your physicality yeah. in the back. Now, Ric Flair being the world champion, was there a lot? Was there animosity towards him from some of the people like? Uh, well, the champ, the champ back then, commanded respect. Like when Harley Jack Briscoe, and then Harley Race had that belt for a long time, and then Flair got the belt. That NWA World Champ, that was considered the World Champ, right? Because he was the only one that was going around the country defending that belt, right? Nobody else was. WWF belt wasn't going anywhere. Bruno stayed. That's why he sold out the Garden 187 times, where it was. He stayed in New York and in Pennsylvania. He never went outside of that area. Right. Flair would go to Japan. He would go here and there and defend that NWA belt, man. So he it was really respected at the time. And then I don't know where it lost its respect. I think, I think all that buyout crap with WCW and all that, when that started to change up, man. Yeah. You know, when Jim Hurd came in. Yeah. That's when it just started going. Right. NWA belts start meaning nothing. Sure. Um, uh, speaking of uh, the times of change, and uh, when, when WCW, when Eric Bischoff took over WCW, WWE was uh, red hot. You got mm -hmm. two companies going going head to head there. Um, wrestling really enjoyed another boom period. Uh, did you see that coming? Um, what was Eric Bischoff like? We were we were hoping. You know, back then, man, was such a whirlwind for those guys because everybody was riding high on the hog and. I hate to say it, man, but that office was doing a lot of partying. Mm. There was a lot of schmoozing going on outside of the ring, and everybody knew what they were doing and stuff like that. And I think, uh, you know, because Eric and I talk about this, some of the conversations, we don't, he called me the other day asking me about a certain situation, why, why Hawk and I never stayed with WCW. And I said, Eric, quite honestly, I, I said, I don't even can't even remember. He asked you this recently? Yeah, just like two days ago. Wow. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I said, man, I said, that's just, just was not good timing. You know, we, we tried, but we couldn't reach a, an agreement, and that was just that. I mean, it was no, no, nothing personal against Eric. I mean, I like Eric, to right. be honest with you. You know, I get along with Eric, and, you know, watching his son wrestle now, man, he's doing a great job, and, you know, and, and stuff like that. But it was it was just one of those time periods. And I think, you know, when you're in that position as boss, and you got other main eventers in your ear, guys aren't used to being main eventers in your ear, and, uh, you know, nobody wants to let go of that stronghold of being the main eventer. Right. You know, and then you have Hawk and I come in who are already a self-made main eventer right away, you know. So it was it was a little bit different story with us. I mean, even when we went over to Japan, we were considered New Japan talent. Right. We weren't considered WCW talent. We would we would dress with the Japanese boys in our locker room. And we were the only Americans to do that. Hmm. Do you think Eric at the time was qualified to be in that position? Or do you think well, he was overwhelmed? I think Eric in the beginning had a lot of help. But what Eric had that you need in this business, you need to be kind of ruthless at times. Right. And Eric was ruthless at times. And you need to have that, man. You, it's not a kind of business for the weak of heart. You know, you can't be a nice guy to everybody because guys will take advantage of you in this business. That's just the way the business is. Right. You know, but um, I know he was an announcer for the AWA. I never even knew a lot of Eric Bischoff except that he was, a, you know, lived in Minnesota. He was an AWA announcer for a while. And, I think he married a girl from Minnesota, if I'm not mistaken, you know, and and that's all I knew. I never, I mean, I knew from Eric Bischoff because the Beverly Brothers told me about him because they were the, <laughs> they were the Minnesota Wrecking Crew or something right. like that when they wrestled there, you know. I remember with the orange hard hats and sledgehammer thing they had, you know, at the one time, Wayne Bloom and Mike Guinness. So that's the only re reason I knew of who Eric Bischoff was. I didn't really even know. Were your dealings with him pretty straightforward, or uh, did you feel? Uh, it was uh, I think it was. If, if I could have got Eric alone, because he and I and Hawk, I think our dealings would have been a lot better. Who was in his ear? You know, I don't know for sure, man. I don't know for sure. I think pretty much Eric ran it, but I think a lot of things went by Hogan. Right. You know, and I don't think, you know, and I, and I know from past experiences there, when, whenever you have an entity that can come in and get an equally as big as a pop as somebody else, like, for instance, I went down to the Raw... Uh, 2012 show, the 1000 episode, mm -hmm. and the reaction I got, and Cena was the main event wrestling that night on the TV. There was no way they were going to bring me back. They're mm -hmm. not going to bring somebody back that's been off TV for 10 years. 
and gets a better pop than their world champion that's coming out of the ring. They're, they're just not going to do it. They don't want to have that. It's To them, it's an embarrassment to the world champ. Nothing against Cena, nothing against... I'm not saying because I'm the greatest of all time. I'm saying as a businessman looking back, I would have done the same thing. I'm not going to put me on TV if, if I'm getting a louder... Someone's getting a louder cheer than my world champion. So you think Hogan had uh, had, had more influence in, in the back? I think he had more influence than what everybody gives him credit for. Right. Yeah. Do you think he's a pol- uh, politician? Oh, hell yes. Yeah. Are you kidding me? He's Hulk Hogan. You don't get to be Hulk Hogan without knowing how to work the, the game. Right. You know? But you always had good dealings with him. I always got a good look with Hogan. I wasn't a friend like with Hogan like Hawk or Nasty Boys or any of those guys were. Because then again, I wasn't the guy that liked to do those kind of things. Now, the Hulk's a lot different today. The Hulk, if he was a Hulk Hogan today, I think we would have got along fine. But back then, it wasn't like that. Right. You know? Um, how things ha- are with Hulk Hogan now, all the, the, the um, things that he went through with the racist stuff and uh, everything. Do you think he got a raw deal by WWE or do you think you they know, were justified? I think it's because of the publicly traded company. Right. That's why he got hand slapped. There's not one of us in the wrestling business, black or white, that hasn't said something stupid like that in their privacy or their own hotel room. Right. Now, for some idiot to record it and play it publicly, that's why Hogan won the lawsuit. Right. And he should have won the lawsuit. I don't think it should have been out there in TMZ or any other thing because it's not any of their people's business or news. Somehow we got our news system in the U.S. has gotten so jacked up that... They think everybody's got the right to know everything, and they really don't. I agree. If I wanted you to know about it, I'd tell you about it, you know? And there's no right to privacy anymore. I mean, I'm sure you get cold calls. I get cold calls now and say, how did that people ever get my number? Right. I'm not even on their mailing list. But they people pay somebody within the system, hey, give me these list of numbers, and they get a number, and you end up getting called, right? And uh, so I think Hogan got really a raw deal. How you could take them off the WWE website, how you going to not honor him as the greatest guy that's ever been in the WWE? I don't know. Right. Because he is. Uh, I mean, you, he, he, if it wasn't for Hulk Hogan, I'll tell you right now, there would be no Roman Reigns, there would be no Cena, there would be no Ultimate Warrior, no, nobody else. The company would be dead. Agreed. Do you think they'll ever bring him back? No. Hmm. I don't see it. I don't see it. I heard rumblings that they were going to do it. If they were going to do it, they would have done it already. Um, I don't know what capacity they would bring him back in. I know somebody threw it around online that he was going to do one last hurrah with Flair, but then Flair got sick, so that's out of the window. I don't know for what reason he would ever want to get back in the ring. Maybe not to work, but just uh, bring him back as an ambassador or something along those lines. Well, maybe as an ambassador, bro, but I think that particular interview is done. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think that particular interview, the way he did it then, I think is done. You know, say your prayers, little Hulkamaniacs. I, I think that era's done. Now, if he came and reinvented a little bit and changed it up, it might work. But I don't know if he could. Now, I don't know. I think he's too big a name to have him come in and be the uh, commissioner of Raw or whatever that position is there, they call it. You know, general manager of Raw or SmackDown. He's above that, man. Agreed. He's above that. But if they worked a gimmick where he would buy in and become, become part owner of WWE... Then it could be Hogan as owner against Shane McMahon as owner. Then I think you could have a battle. Because I think Vince needs to go like this. He needs to slip out. He can stay behind the scenes, but I think that the new face, like Shane or Hunter, has got to be involved, where you have the new school guy's ideas against Hulk Hogan's ideas, and you have them clash with right. talent. I think that would work. Right. And I think it would be cool, and I think the fans would love it if Hogan says, hey, Say he's got the Raw or SmackDown crew. Listen, all this high-flying bullcrap that everybody's doing and nobody's selling finishes ain't going to cut it. This is the way we're going to do business. I think the fans want to see it go back to basics. Because I think so much, so many times in a match, they're going like this, like, a, like it's a ping-pong match going boom, 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 boom. They can't register all the crap that's going on in the ring. Right. They're lost. You know, the smart fan can. Like, you're a smart fan. You sure. know, a lot of the guys I know are smart. Smart fan can figure it out, but the guy who's being introduced to it, they can't figure it out. There's surely not the 10 and 12 year old doesn't know what's going on. Right. You know? All right, let's, uh, let's begin to wind this down with a journey through the golden years, your golden years, your, your, your peaks. Favorite territory? Oh, NWA. 
By far? By far. What about AWA? I liked the AWA, but there was too much... Uh, too much dictatorshipism by Vern, pretty much by Vern, more by Greg than Vern. Was Vern out of touch? Uh, yeah, probably. He didn't know how to adjust with the times. Right. You know, he kept wanting to do these like we wrestled the Fabs one time and wanted us to do the old switcheroo finish where we beat up one Fab, the referee pushes out, the healthy one grabs the injured one, goes in and lays and fakes that he's hurt. And, and I, you know, my philosophy was, well, we're street fighters. I never take my eye off you. Right. So if I don't take my eye off you and I'm watching this, the fans know I'm watching this, why am I going to make pretend like he's the same guy and get beat? That doesn't make sense. And they got all pissy about us for that one one time. So that's, <laughs> that's, where, we belt, that's where we dropped the belts of Garvin and Regal out of the blue. So you had an, op you had an opinion and you dropped the We strap. had an opinion, yeah. <laughs> Listen, back then, Vern was so untouchable. I remember Greg Gagne came at me one time in a, in a, in a locker room. We were doing... And back then... When you did Canadian TV, it had to be filmed in Canada to show on Canadian TV. You couldn't film it in the U.S. and ship it. Right. It, it, even digitally, you had to film it in Montreal or in uh, Winnipeg. We filmed it in Winnipeg, and you showed it all over Canada. So we're in there, and I'm talking over, I'm working with, uh, who am I working with at the time? I think I'm working with either the Freebirds or somebody. We're working for a title match, and I'm going over the finish with Ellering on different ideas what to do later on in the night. You know, I said, Paul, give me your ideas so that I could, Think I'm over all day long, you know? And uh, Greg Gagne yells over to me, hey, Joe, you want to shut your, you know, blinking mouth because, you know, we're getting ready to do interviews here. Whoa. And um, I, I sat there, I looked at him, and I said, Greg, unless you want me to bitch slap you in this locker room in front of everybody and knock you out, don't ever talk to me like that again. Wow. And I said that to him, and nobody talked to one of the Gagne's like that. And that about 15 minutes later, when uh, Finish was... Uh, Vern was given Blackjack Mulligan, who was the agent at the time, or Blackjack Lanza, who was given him the it was the agent at the time, was giving him the finish. I walked over to Vern and I pantsed Vern all the way down to his ankles. Oh my Nobody God. touched Vern Gotti at the time. Right. But I to break the ice, I did it. I walked up to Vern and you know, Steiner was a young kid coming through wrestling camp. I pulled his pants right down to his ankles and Vern didn't even skip a beat. He just bent down, picked them up, and put them back on. And no heat. Looked, looked at me. No, nobody said nothing. Wow. But everybody was so afraid right. that Vern Gagne is going to stretch. I said, he ain't got to stretch nothing. <laughs> <laughs> that was my thought process, you know? Right. So that's what we did to, to ease up the tension, you know? Was, but, there ever, uh, was there tension with you and Greg going forward after that? No, we were Matt? fine after that. Yeah. I mean, I, I called him out on it, and from then on, we've got along great. I get along good with Greg today. Sure. I like Greg. Uh, no hard feelings at all. You know, he said I was a young. He's a car salesman. I was right? a young, twenty-six-year-old punk in the wrestling business back then. You yeah. know, and here's Greg, who already paid his dues, was world champ over and over for AWA and singles champ. And you know, I should have probably respected him more, but right then and there, you know, you're doing that fine line of disrespect in front of everybody. That's where I draw the line. Right. Don't you pull me over and talk to me. Don't humiliate me in front of everybody because mm. I'm gonna have to stand my ground. Right. You know. And that's where we were at a couple times in the wrestling business. <laughs> Did word of that spread? Oh, yeah. Like imagine. wildfire. I can imagine. Like freaking gasoline. Someone poured gasoline on it. <laughs> Guys, because you didn't have TV and locker rooms never talked to each other. There was no cell phones back then. Right. No internet. But it, no nothing. But it, everybody calling their house lines. You ain't going to believe what Animal <laughs> just did to Ver or Greg on you, you know? Oh, yeah. It spread like crazy. Whew. Talk about, and uh, did you ever have any run-ins with the Von Erics? You know, we were going to go down to, we done, went down to wrestle a couple of times. They never put us against the boys. We call them the boys because they didn't want to have the boys wrestle Hawk and I. Right. In fear, um, I forget the guy's name, was Danny, Dave, Danny what? He used to book for Texas. Uh, I think he was a referee for a while. David Manning? Was that it, Manning? Was it Manning or Davis? David Dave. Manning? Could have been. He was one of the refs. Friend of Flair's was booking for Texas, right? And Flair was, I mean, I, one time I saw, that's funny, I saw Flair wrestle Kerry Von Erich, and Kerry Von Erich went to do a sunset flip, but Flair was about three feet off to the one side from him, so it's Kerry Von Erich did a sunset flip, but nobody there. Right. It was great. I loved it. <laughs> Kerry was so messed up. But no, they kept, they kept the boys away from Hawk and I, because at that time, we were eating everybody up, and mm. we would have ate them up too. Yeah. And they didn't want us to eat them up in case for the future we were going to come back and book. And I think that for the future, they expected us to oh, work with David. Ken Mantell was also one of the books. Maybe it was Ken Mantell. Yeah. 
was also uh, he wanted us to work for him, you know, because Gene Hernandez was working for him too at the time too. Yeah. And uh, so, and so was Chris Adams. And they wanted us to come in there and lo- slowly work with those guys. Well, then both Chris Adams and Gene you know, Hernandez died. And then shortly after that, David Von Erich dies. So you had all these guys dying one after another yeah. because of drugs. And once David died, well, there went their idea of that. And well, then Kerry, shortly after that, you know, got in the motorcycle accident and it just all fell. Is there ever a, any point, and I know it doesn't affect you, but is there ever any point when, when you start seeing deaths like Chris Adams and, and, and various people throughout the business that there's a wake-up call in the locker room or are people so in tuned in what they're doing that they don't, it doesn't even register with them? I think um, the it's not going to happen to me thing goes on a lot. Yeah. And back then it did. Oh, I got a high tolerance. Hawk was, another, was one of them. And Hawk did out of a hell of a tolerance. I'm telling you that. Drinking and somas and all sorts of crap. And he had a tolerance. But sooner or later, that heart could only go like this so many times before you you beat the crap out of it. And it won't do that. It won't go like this anymore. It won't flex. And that's exactly what happened, man. He He just damaged it so bad that there was no beats left. Do you think the wrestling business feeds into it because it's an ego-driven business where it uh, over-inflates the ego, where people can't don't start to believe? I mean, people, some guys in this business, I think, start to believe in their gimmick. They're larger than life. The larger than life type thing. And I think once you start believing in your gimmick, listen, right now, I don't care what anybody says, the only true badass in wrestling is Brock Lesnar. Agreed. Okay. He's the only guy that can go from one sport to the other one and be the guy. Right. He's getting ready to fight over there again, and the guy he's going to fight to say he's going to knock him out and take the belt mm-hmm. right away. I don't even know who the champ is. I don't even follow anymore. I don't either. But I heard he's going to do it. And so in that aspect, nobody is a bit more of a badass than Brock. Now, if you're talking amateur wrestling-wise, that Kurt Angle's in his heyday, well, I watched Kurt throw around Brock mm-hmm. back his first trip into the WWF. Kurt Angle was a badass, but now it's different. Now we're in a whole different era. Brock's already fought, you know, what, eight, ten years in, in the UFC, and now they can tell that Brock can fight, too. Right. Now it's a whole different ballgame. You know, he's the only badass left in wrestling right now, I think. I mean, my, my own opinion. I agree. Going back to the uh, old days, uh, favorite team to work? Uh, it's a tough one, man. Like I said, Hawk and I worked main events for 22 years against great teams. Rock and Roll Express? No, we never got to work against those guys. We worked against those guys in the Crockett Cup first year. Right. Um, uh, probably, let me see, we had great matches with the Natural Disasters when nobody thought they'd be a great team and they ended up being really good. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, probably with a manager, it'd have to be Cornette and the Mid Express. Without a manager, it would have to be the horseman. Okay. We just had great chemistry with Tully and Arn. Right. And Bobby and Bobby and Dennis, too. But we had better chemistry with Tully and Arn. Were you surprised they didn't give you guys more of a run with demolition? Yeah. We all four of us were disappointed. We came in there, and of course, they were, were the original knockoffs of Hawk and I. Right. Everybody thought. Again, Hawk and I didn't care. They were both our buddies, man, but we didn't care about, about any of that. But, uh, yeah, and Barry Darso and I talked about it. I said, oh, man, I can't wait for you to come in. Cause, and our school, because Barry was another one of those Robbinsdale, Minnesota guys, we all called each other Billy. Right. Our names were Billy. He says, Billy Joe, can't wait for you to come in at WWF, man. We're going to have a great run. They had us the first match, beat them in eight minutes. Yeah. Now where do you go? <laughs> now it's done. Right. Nowhere to go. A couple matches after that, we screwed screwed him out of the belts with the Hart Foundation. Didn't even tag us up with the Hart Foundation to fight Demolition. It was just like all over with. Right. Done. When you talk about you weren't, uh, you had no animosity towards Demolition, obviously, because you respected the boys who were carrying out that game. Yeah, it's not the boys' fault. Right, exactly. But the office, obviously, was, was ripping off the road warriors. Oh, well, listen, it was, they made Demolition right after Hawk and I said no to a first contract. So you see that for the first time. Oh, and yeah. And what, what, what do you, what do you, what, I, where are well, you and Hawk think? Well, people, guys in the locker would come say to us, hey, man, you see WWS road warriors? Right. And they called it Demolition. And right. So, oh, yeah, well, there you go. I, to be honest, honestly, I liked the hockey mask with the black Sure. Spikes. Yeah. I liked it. Did Hawk but, flip out? 
No, neither one of us slipped out. I mean, right. I knew both those guys. So right. I, we knew it wasn't their idea. Right. But I mean more at the office. Or was it, well, just, we, bu- we, we it thought, was just business is business? I, you know what we thought? All right, assholes. We're going to show you. All right. And we just continued to sell out with Flair and the Horsemen in the midnight. And it wasn't hurting us in the least. We were still selling a lot of crap merchandise. And it wasn't like our phone wasn't ringing for it to come in there, too. Don't, don't think it wasn't. Because right. it was, you know. And so, let Demolition go, and Ellering told us, someday you'll go up there, guys, and you'll get to wrestle Demolition, and the people will make the decision. And as soon as they played our music to go up against Demolition, it was like a no-brainer. Yeah. The LOD chance started happening, and it was freaking, it was an easy match, right. right off the bat. And we all knew each other, so it made it easier yet. It was like four strangers getting in the ring. Right. When I wrestled Bill, like I said, the mass superstar, Barry was the was uh, Crusher Khrushchev and himself, Barry Darso. So it wasn't like I didn't wrestle with Barry. I went to camp with Barry. Right. You know, so we all knew each other. So it was an easy match, and we all got along. When you get along with guys like that, man, you don't mind giving up your body and trusting them with it because you know they're going to be careful with it. Sure. When you talk about, uh, we talked about the WWE merchandise machine, what was the merchandise like in the NWA and in in before WWE? Did you get to control that yourself? No, no. We, we kind of gave that up because we were getting a guaranteed contract. Okay, so... The- so we were willing to give that up because it wasn't the same kind of machine. Right. At the time, we knew we were selling a lot, but in that area, the Rock and Roll Express was killing it merchandise-wise. Right. Because they were the kitty girly gimmick, sure. you know, and, and all the little young girls liked them and the young kids liked them. The kid, mostly the kids like that, so it wasn't that much as little girls like us or teenage girls. Right. Because we were like the bullies of the bullies, and we yeah. came in, so the kids liked the guys who were upstanding guys, you know? Right. So the more hardcore guys like us and the more frilly people like them, and it worked out good. Very seldom can you have two hot babyface teams in a company. Right. But we were so different, it worked. Was there, because you were a merchandise machine, and wherever you went, mm-hmm. did you ever think to yourself, like, because teams that couldn't sell merchandise out there and that you could, you were kind of shortchanging yourself a little bit because you were a merchandise machine where, say, maybe uh, Midnight Express or whoever couldn't sell that merchandise. So the company is making more money off of you mm-hmm. than they are anybody else. Well, I, my philosophy is what they should do with the, in, the, in the wrestling business. <coughs> Give the guy a contract of what he's worth. Take all the merchandise, put it in a pool, divvy it up against everybody equally. Hmm. I bet you a lot of people in your position wouldn't have that. Uh... No, but still, okay, okay. If you're making a half million dollars, you think you deserve a million, and he wants to pay eight hundred and fifty grand. Right. You're not going to be happy with eight hundred and fifty grand. Right. Pay me eight fifty. You still, if they split all the merchandise equally amongst everybody, you're still going to get the extra two fifty. Right. So you're going to make that million. Right. It's stupid. It's. It is. It, do, it but doesn't I, make sense to it me. It is, but I, I think in the mentality of a, of a wrestler would be well, especially somebody who's well, actually producing. It's very, it's very much a me, 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 me thing sometimes mm. when you get to the big dance. But when you start forgetting that you're only as good as the guy you're in the ring with, then there's a problem. Right. Does that happen more often than not? I think so. I watched some matches today and. I'll see guys take some hellacious kicks and they'll stagger back one step. Right. And the thrust kick look like it knocked their jaw off. Right. And they don't sell it. And that really pisses me off because I'm telling you right now, it doesn't matter who you are. Hawk and I would have jumped your crap if you didn't sell our stuff. Right. We literally jumped guys in the back for not selling it. You mm. know? And, and I would expect them to jump my crap if I didn't sell it either. Yeah. You know, because it's a business. It's a dance. If your dance partner's not working with you, it looks like a crappy dance. Right. You know, well, and you can't forget that. When you're when you're in in the middle of it, when you're when you're performing, is there any point in time where your legacy starts to become important to you? Like now, how you're going to be viewed now, greatest tag team of all time, but perhaps maybe like 20 years ago when you're in the middle of it. Do you ever, does that ever occur to you like I want to be viewed as this. Like, does your legacy mean something to you at the you time? Know, no, I never thought that. I, hey, I wanted to be the greatest of all time. I never even thought came across my mind once. Right. I said I want to make a living for my family. That was my main thing. I want to pay my bills, put my kids through school, be able to buy them a car when I want to buy them a car, have a decent house to live in. Right. You know, and I'll be happy. When I get 
to my age now, and I look back at it, I love being recognized as the greatest of all time. To me, that's the greatest compliment from the fan and the guys that say, hey, man, you guys were definitely the shit. You right. know what I mean? You were definitely it. You had, and that's what Flair says about it all the time. He goes, the Road Warriors have the, had the it factor probably more than any other team that we'll ever have. We just can adapt to anybody's style, anybody's moves, anything, and, and we can be fluent doing it and make it look like it wasn't even a challenge to do it, you know? That is, I think, what's different today because some guys are so light it's sickening. Some guys don't lay enough st- I, I still don't think guys lay enough stuff in today. Right. There's not enough stuff laid in on TV. There's so many times you see on a pay-per-view where people are taking a bump. I just got a video from freaking Saudi Arabia where, you know, Jeff Hardy did a, the flip off the top rope and didn't even hit Jinder Mahal, and Jinder Mahal took the bump. <laughs> the only thing Whoa, I- did the wind knock you down, Jinder? You're freaking 6'5", <laughs> with the, ripped up. I you saw didn't... Titus O'Neil fell, fell on his Titus, window. I saw a trip going down to the ring. <laughs> what a way to make a, an impact in Saudi Arabia. Hi, I'm going to dive underneath the ring. <laughs> Thank God there was no center post. <laughs> he, slid, he slid under the ring. It was the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen. Hey, listen, we've all made mistakes. I remember tripping over the cable going down to the ring in the NWA. I remember going to jump over the top rope and hawked it. No, I was going to do that. He went to jump and got tangled up and right on my back right. with my spikes on. I go to get up and my spikes are hitting the bottom rope and I'm going poof, 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 like three times going up and down. I was so mad. Oh, my God, I was mad. <laughs> but I should have been more mad at myself than anything else. I was the idiot that did it. You know? Right. WWE Hall of Fame. Is it a legit Hall of Fame? Like when, when I mean... Um, there's not a physical building. Uh, the, the, yeah. You talk about somebody like Bam Bam Bigelow not being in, but Coco Beware is. I'm not disparaging Coco Beware yeah. in any way, but do you think it's a legit Hall of Fame? Well, I think if you look at the guys that aren't in, the guys that aren't in had, had heat with the business. You know? Right. They had a little bit of heat with the, heat with the boss. So the guys that heat with the boss aren't in. They had no choice but to put Hawk and I in. Right. I mean, if you were to leave us out of the Hall of Fame, well, what we've done for tag team wrestling, I'm sure their emails were barking up anyway because we, they waited so long for us to go in. Right. You know, but I think, uh, I think now and today, the fans are looking at it more as a legitimate Hall of Fame. I think for the first maybe six, seven, eight years, it was looked at as a joke. And I think the boys are realists. Um, I don't know who votes you in now, but like for the regular Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame in Dallas, you get voted in. J.J. Dillon is on the board of it. You get voted in by your peers. Right. You know, I'm, I'm getting ready to go in, uh, I don't know if it's this year or next year, but the Hall of Fame in Iowa, the Dan Gable Hall of Fame. Well, Dan Gable was an Olympic freaking wrestler and a coach. He's got a Hall of Fame too. Now they just changed the qualifications. Now a non amateur wrestler can get put in for what they've done for athletics in the community. So now I'm going to be up for that for next year. Hawk and I will be. So that, that to me is like a, like a war shooting Hall of Fame. Right. I love all the Hall of Fames, man. Did Listen, it mean something to you when you went in the WWE? I mean, Yeah, course, man. You know why? Because to me, it made the fans happy. Right. And it's, they fly your family in. Your family gets to come. Well, actually, they don't fly your family in. You fly your family in. <laughs> they don't even fly your no, family no. in? But you have them come. You celebrate it. It's a good celebration for them because your family likes to believe it was real, too, even though they know it's not. Right. And it's a good thing. It's a goodwill thing. I think now it's becoming more prestigious. Sure. So I think now it means more today than it probably did 10, 15 years ago. But, hey, it is what it is, man. As long as the fans appreciate what you did in this wrestling business, you know, to me, that's enough said right there. That's good. Right. Um, what do you think about uh, the rise of uh, American wrestlers in New Japan and how a team like the Young Bucks can can basically market themselves in this day and age and put their T-shirts in hot topics and to be like a hot thing in American yeah, wrestling? Social media, bro. Right. It's all social media. Like I said, if Hawk and I had this social media today, you wouldn't even be able to get us to do appearances. Right. We'd be making so much money. And Hot Topics, they're getting ready. I mean, look, after all these years, they're getting ready to put my T-shirts in either Target or Walmart right? for Pro Wrestling Tees. I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, that's crazy to me. And we're, we're only second in sales behind the Bullet Club. And, you know, Hawk's been gone for 15 years. Do you think if you could, if you could talk, to, talk to Hawk again 
and you could tell him what the future held. Oh, bro, he would have cleaned up in an instant. Yeah. In an instant. In an instant, because when you look at it, I mean, someone said to me the other day, uh, they, they brought me over to take a picture. I was at WrestleCon right next to the Young Bucks and took a picture with them. Now, even at my age now, I dwarf them. Yeah. You can imagine when we were at our biggest wrestling those guys, they would have been just like the Hardys in the day, taking that thing off my shoulders, man. Right. You know? <laughs> right. Taking the doomsday. Right. Because that's what the business would have called for. Right. No matter who you are. If I could do it to Ricky Choshu in Japan, right. I could do it to the Young Bucks anywhere in the country. If you could tell Hawk that, hey, we can, make, we can go on the comic book con circuit and uh, yeah, just I, clean up. I, I don't think, do you think you know, he would have been interested in something like that? Oh, yeah. But I yeah. think you know, when you're in that situation doing what he was doing, you got blinders on, bro. We used to call it on the road mode. Yeah. You know, okay, I'm here. I got to go to this town. I don't see anything off to the side. I can't see anything out there. I can't see other possibilities. I can see what's ahead of me. All that I know is I'm going to go wrestle. And afterwards, I'm going to get effed up. Right. And that's all the guy saw for a long time. Right. You know, and when you get in that mode, you know, I don't know because I was never like that, man, but I heard alcoholism and all that other stuff is probably one of the worst addictions you could ever have. Mm. And once you get hooked, man, it's like the Grim Reaper's got a hold of you and you just can't let go. Sure. And, you know, I love my partner to death, man. And I wish, listen, nobody wishes he was here today more than me. Not only to be an uncle for my kids, to see, you know, to be, you know, a, a, a second grandpa to my grandkids, everything, man. It's, just, you know, I wish he was here, but he's not. Right. And sometimes you got to pay the price for the mistakes you do in life. And that's why you got to try to live as clean as you possibly can. Well, I think he lives on through you and your spirit. Oh, yeah, man. I, listen, I'm keeping a Road Warriors thing alive. I keep the LOD thing alive. I never say, hey, it's all about me. It's always the Road Warriors, always the Legion of Doom. You know, so I always give props to both of us. Because without a hawk, there was no animal. And without an animal, there's no hawk. Right. End well, story right there. there might be a debate. There might be people who have opinions. But I think that anybody who ever grew up in the golden age of wrestling, uh, can, there can be no doubt in their mind who the greatest tag team ever was. And that's the Road Warriors, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Well, I appreciate it, man. Thank you. And I want to thank you so much for being here, Road Warrior Animal. No problem, man. It was thank an honor. You, thank you very much, man. Thank you so much. All right, Thank bro. you, everybody, for joining us here with Reflections, and we'll see you next time.